my brain just pictured Marco doing the Kermit flail, and if Marco does the Kermit flail, several people are going to die. Yes. <laughs> Inevitably. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Lux, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm Ben McKenzie, and my pronouns are he, him. Welcome to Pratt Chat, the monthly Terry Pratchett Book Club podcast. Each month, we discuss one of Terry Pratchett's books or short stories with a special guest. This month, we're reading Strata, or Whose Line Is It Anyway? <laughs> and, and our guest is Specfic fan and occasional writer, EJ Mann. Welcome, EJ. Thanks, Ben. Uh, hi, I'm EJ, and my pronouns are they, them. It's great to be here. It's such a pleasure to have you here. We Now, I do occasionally use this podcast as an excuse to get very old friends onto the show. <laughs> and we've known each other for a very long time, but I thought of you for this episode for a number of reasons, one of which is because we kind of met through the convention scene in, in Melbourne, at least partly, didn't we? We did, largely, in fact, originally. Yeah. And uh, in fact, I think the last time I saw you was at the last Australian Discworld convention back in 2019. Mm -hmm. In the before times. Yes. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but and this is one of the reasons I thought of you, because I know in previous cons you've done some really great panels about weird biology, both in science fiction and real weird biology on Earth, because this is an interest mm -hmm. of yours. And I think you were doing a, a Discworld version of that panel. Am I remembering that right? This is terrible. I am genuinely trying to remember what I was doing at the last Discord <laughs> convention. Uh, yes, I'm pretty sure I was doing a redux of that. It wasn't the first time I'd done that one, but yes, I'm pretty sure I was doing that one again. So I, I've been a regular in the Discworld and more broadly sci-fi fan con scene for quite a long time, doing a lot of the con organizing, but mm. also I like being on panels, but also I feel like a lot of the sort of classic interests that people would talk about at these panels, I don't necessarily know enough to talk about. So I've developed a habit of when I'm involved in organizing the con anyway, seeing if I can create panels that will let me just like wedge my special interests in there. So <laughs> Weird Wildlife has been a really good one for me. It's, that's been, you know, quite a perennial favorite. And Wildlife's been part of your professional career at times as well, hasn't it? Oh, very much so. Yeah. So I am a professional and amateur nature nerd. Um, <laughs> I was a park ranger for many years running around the wilds of Melbourne. Um, mm -hmm. And these days I work for Bush Heritage Australia, who are a not-for-profit organization. I'm not sure how much I should spruik them here because I don't want to sound like I'm just here to publicize them, but I do think they are very cool. They buy a lot of landscapes of environmental significance. They buy private land that would otherwise potentially go to developers, that kind of thing. They do a lot of work looking after and, and making that land healthier again. They do a lot of work with Aboriginal groups and traditional owners on their land to support them, which is fantastic. They're just, they're a very cool charity. Well oh, worth yeah. looking at. So, I agree. And there's a great um, thing on the Instagram where it's Pedro Pascal's frogs which I thought was yes. particularly cool. Yes, I can't take credit for that, but I do work with the person who came up with that and she's extremely proud of it. Also a good friend of mine. Hang on, hold on. Pedro Pascal's frogs? As frogs. I mean, you must have seen some of the Pedro Pascal as X where he has just the amazing outfits in various colours, but this one is specifically <laughs> Pedro Pascal as Australian frogs, which <laughs> just glorious. Okay, that's great. We'll link to that in the episode notes. Yeah. No, they're a great charity. They're one of the ones I've been supporting for a while. So yes, I, you know, and I didn't ask you on because you worked for them. I only found that out after I'd asked you on. So I feel like it's all coming together. Nice. Nice. I love that you already knew us and supported us. That is delightful. Yeah. But look, we are going to go to a whole other world today um, where we're going to talk about some very different weird biology and discuss strata, which Listener, if you're not familiar, hopefully you are, because you know that we don't just cover the Discworld books on this podcast. This is one of Pratchett's much earlier novels. It's his third novel from 1981, uh, when he was 33 years old. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. Outrage. This book is slightly older than I am, and that gives me some kind of feelings. 
<laughs> but this was his last novel that he wrote before he started writing the Discworld. Before he started writing the Discworld, or was he writing okay? That's the a Discworld? yep. That's a fair distinction. Clearly yep. on his mind. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, and at the time he was like, I don't think I'm done with this idea. I've got another book I'm <laughs> writing about this idea. We'll see how that goes. Um, but we should begin with a reading of the blurb. The excavation showed that the fossilised plesiosaur had been holding a placard which read, End nuclear testing now. That was nothing unusual. But then came a discovery of something which did intrigue Kin Arad. A flat earth was something new. That's it. That's the whole blurb <laughs> on my <laughs> my nineties Corgi edition of Strata. That's like that's enough, right? That got me in. I mean, mm-hmm. I'd already read some Discworld books by the time I got to this, but I was like, yeah, <laughs> I that would hook me in, but I wouldn't necessarily feel once I'd read it that what hooked me in was what I got, even like because it's deeper themes rather than plot. Mm. Uh huh. It, it does feel a bit like the kind of blurb written by a publishing industry that didn't quite know what to do with these books yet. Like, mm. you know, this is before we have the whole, like, look, it's Terry Pratchett. You're going to like it. Just read it. It's like, mm. I suspect, based on evidence of some of his other early books that I have got or seen early editions of, I suspect the original blurb was much longer <laughs> because it would have been <laughs> oh, published okay, in... Then in hardcover and would have had the blurb on the inside of the dust jacket. And they usually used most of that space back then. Right. Sometimes both, like the front and the back inside flap. Yeah. So I might see if I can find a copy of the original blurb. Sometimes those are quite hard to find because you nobody posts them online and you need to go and find a first edition copy of the book, which since he became famous are quite expensive. Mm. Uh, although the, if you do see the first edition of Strata, um, well, more so the Dark Side of the Sun, but the, they've got these very interesting covers because it was before Josh Kirby was doing the art. So he was brought in by Corgi when they republished The Color of Magic. And then when they republished his early books, they got him to do covers for those as well. But like the early ones, they're kind of, I mean, the the first cover for um, The Dark Side of the Sun is drawn by Terry Pratchett. It's a little illustration yeah. of the mechanical dragonflies on one of the planets that gets visited towards the end, which is a weird choice to make because it's such a minor <laughs> part of the plot. <laughs> but I guess it was an easier thing to draw than, you know, like a bank. I mean, I had no idea that that was like, is he is he good? This sounds terrible, but like, is it uh, a decent story? Yeah, he's got a cute cartoony style. Like he illustrated huh. his own first novel, The Carpet People, throughout and they're, they're mm. delightful. Huh. Yeah, and I would say, you know, you know, there's that very popular, quite heavily Quentin Blake inspired art style that's sort of sketchy, cartoony drawings that's been emulated by a lot of other people and including an artist named Mark Beach who's done illustrations for some of the recent editions of Truckers and Pratchett's other children's work. But it's it's not the same as that, but it's, it's in the same ballpark, I think. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Well, the, yeah, I've definitely seen a cover for Strata, which is not the cover that I was used to seeing, but looks like one of those just incredibly generic sci-fi 80s covers where you're like, this this person just wanted to draw a cool space scene and may not have read the book. Yeah. And it was just, it was very strange to see on a Terry Pratchett book. Yeah. There's some great uh, other covers too. Like I, I looked up um, some of the international covers and there's not too many for this book. It hasn't been as widely translated as a lot of his other work, but there's a, a couple of great ones which have illustrations of the three main characters, which I love. I love to see different artists or art styles interpret the characters in the book, particularly when they're weird, non-human characters. <laughs> it's so good. I have a question now. I'm curious. I have mm. a reader question. Do any of them portray Kin Arad as a black woman? Because I'm pretty sure she is. Mm. Yeah, I also think she is. I think there is one, but you're right, like a lot of the covers don't. Uh, and I think this is a detail that gets missed because it's subtle, right? Because he describes her initially as having dark skin. Midnight black skin, which yeah. itself yeah. sounds like a body modification of some kind. Like it doesn't sound like... Doesn't sound like a normal human skin tone, yes. Mm. And and then she changes her skin to be all silvery when she's greeting the mm. people who come onto the planet. And we'll, this will all make sense, listener, because we'll get into the plot in a second. And then it's not really mentioned again, except there's like little hints that she's gone back to having dark skin uh, later in the book. There's a there's a moment of questionable problematicness later on where they refer yes. to her basically posing as an Ethiopian princess, which yes, to me went mm. ah yeah okay. 
black woman. We'll get to that. We'll we'll come back to that. But yes, I would interpret her as a person of color, um, even though it doesn't really come up because for most of the book, she's the only human. <laughs> like she she interacts with a few other humans at the start, and then it's her and the disc people who are humans as well. It should be said. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's get into the plot. <laughs> Let's start at the start and meet Ken Arad, which is how I imagined her name should be pronounced. But she's a planetary engineer. If you've read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it's very Magrathea vibes. And this is post-Hitchhikers. So that is definitely an influence, I feel, here. But she's a planetary engineer making new planets, which they do with these strata machines, which, as the book goes on, we find out are not invented by humans. They were discovered as, like, leftover bits of technology from one of the various precursor civilizations which are mentioned during the book, classic sci-fi trope. But she's finishing off this latest world that she's making for the company, just with a capital C, (laughs) um, because they're the most important and biggest one. And she has to deal with a couple of her talented juniors who are inserting the blurbs plesiosaur (laughs) into the crust of the planet as a bit of a practical joke for the future settlers when they finally start looking at the paleontology of their planet. I, I remember when I first read this, this very this confused me because I'm like, but they know the planet is built. Like, why would they be confused by that? And then it sort of becomes a little clearer later on that maybe the future generations won't remember that the planet was built for them and that they settled it mm-hmm. um, from another world because that's the kind of society they're setting up is one where that could very well happen. Mm. So, yeah, but I found that quite confusing at the start. But I also should mention the little kind of, uh, I don't know, is it a frontispiece, the little quote, fake quote at the start? Oh, yeah, I spent way too long on Google trying to figure out if that was real. Yeah, <laughs> about the the Natural History Museum having a secret basement where they put like the Neanderthal skull mm-hmm. with gold fillings and the Tyrannosaurus with a wristwatch. I would love it to be real, like so badly. <laughs> Well, the thing about Terry Pratchett, right, is that, like, his books are so full of references. Yeah. There were several things in this book where I spent way too long on Google only to conclude that they were literally made up for the book. But, you know, I don't I don't, I don't, don't trust him to have made things up. There are always going to be references. Yeah. Well, mm. we know he loved doing research and reading about stuff, and he'd squirrel things away and go, that's interesting, and then it mm. wouldn't show up in the book he was writing at the time, but it'd show up in another book, like, five years later. Mm. And this is, you know, this is his third book, so he hasn't been doing that for very long. But he has been working as a journalist, and then at the time he was working at the electricity board where he was, you know, sort of a PR person. So, you know, there's some of the technology speak in this might have been influenced by that. Light bulb moment. But this part of the book, kind of establishing the world of Kinnerad and where she's coming from, there's a lot that you don't find out here that you find out kind of during her journey but it kind of sets up this world of a future Earth civilization with hugely advanced technology who are making planets and settling them and dealing with petty bureaucratic nonsense <laughs> of um, disciplining your junior employees. Did this give us, like, you know, I've been that kid at work vibes? I mean, I don't think I was ever that kid at work. That You have to be at a certain level of, I don't know, extremely bright and ambitious to be that kid at work, I feel. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. I don't think that like was me either. The fact either. that she was disciplining him but also going, oh, yeah, I see myself there. Yeah, it was a very uh, mentor-mentee kind of relationship yeah. going on. It did feel like he was being set up for more of a spot in the plot and then I was like, okay, all right, goodbye. See ya. <laughs> not, not the only time that happens in this book. <laughs> oh, oh really? yeah, okay. I'll be interested to see I, that. I have some feelings about a couple of other characters. <laughs> Should we also flag that she's also the author of the only book in the world? (laughs) That's right. Yes, Continuous Creation, her book about the history of the universe, which becomes a running gag later on where everybody that she meets wants to get their copy, which is, you know, translated into whatever their culture uses as a physical book uh, signed or whatever the equivalent of being signed is. It's never for themselves. It's always for their, like, you know, relative that they can (laughs) can pop it off on, young relative. But no, I I found that fascinating, but we should make it clear. It's not that no one reads anything else. It's that books now are these things called filmies, which I feel like Terry Pratchett basically predicted the existence of e-books without predicting that we'd still call them books. 
Yeah. So, so there's still this digital medium, but then for whatever reason, Ken Arad literally reinvented the printing process because for whatever reason, she really wanted this to be on paper. Well, it's kind of insinuated this is one of the things where she's bored because one of her character mm. traits is she's really old. Like she wears a mark on her forehead to show that she's 200 years old because like a lot of humans, she uses life prolonging drugs to keep or, or and it's not drugs is it it's like a was it gene surgery is that what they call it mm. it's like currency like tokens they have treatments but I feel like yeah tokens buy the treatments that's right yeah so it's got this yeah this fascinating thing where the company the company basically has its own currency which has become the dominant currency in the universe as far as we can tell which is called mm. days and the only thing days can buy is longevity treatment yeah but that's become just the, the most valuable thing which i found Absolutely fascinating. There's there's multiple things in this book where I'm like, you could have written an entire book just around that, and you made it this really interesting throwaway thing, and then moved on. I love it. Mm. Yeah, it's like there's a film, and there's probably lots of stories about this. I think is it called In Time? There's like the love one, and then there's a the one where they use time as currency. It's got Olivia Wilde in it in a really small role, and they all get paid in time on their wrists. And so like you're catching the bus, and you have to pay with like X amount of minutes or whatnot. And then if there's inflation then you might not be able to afford to go home without dying, which is a very interesting concept. Whoa, that's that's intense. I should say Kin's longevity and the fact that she's got a mark on her head showing how old she is are both things that are part of the direct parody or riff on Ringworld because the main human character in Ringworld similarly has extended his life using a drug called Booster Spice and has a mark on his forehead to show, hey, I'm like really old. <laughs> Um, and in fact, he starts the book, he's, he's celebrating his 200th birthday. So there's a lot of specific references to Ringworld in particular. And Pratchett openly acknowledged that this book was largely a parody of Ringworld, the Larry Niven novel about a world that is shaped like a ring. But this, I think it's its own thing. Like uh, we'll get into this as we go, because there are so many references to that other book. But I do feel like this book really stands on its own, despite mm. a lot of specific reference points. Because as you say, like, yeah, you could have written a book that was all about that, but this book is not all about that. That forms part of the background of the society that Kin is in and why they're building all these new worlds, but it's not the be-all and end-all of it. Anyway, so she's dealing with this, like, subordinate who has gone out of, what's the word, gone off script, I suppose, <laughs> uh, and put this uh, fake dinosaur into the strata using the strata machine. And then she notices something weird in her room and a dude materializes who has been there invisibly, which is an impossible technology, even for Kin's advanced society, in order to surprise her. Another thing that Terry Pratchett appears to have predicted in advance, and I mean, I don't know, these might be him just riffing off other sci-fi that came up with it first, but he does appear to have predicted the Roomba in that <laughs> one of the ways that we get a hint that there is something weird going on is that there is a cleaning robot wandering around Kin's office and going around a patch in the floor for some reason. <laughs> yeah. And it's a fly. It's a flying Roomba, isn't it? Oh, it might have been. I can't well, there remember. Was, there was more than one robot because at one point the fridge just like wanders up to offer these apprentices a drink. It's a levitating drinks fridge. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, just sort of lots of weird. Like, like you can tell it was written in like the late seventies, early eighties. It's like, yeah, we're imagining a future society. There'll be like floating things and little robots and stuff. Like, uh, it's no longer that retro futurism where it's like all big chunky robots and jetpacks and rocket ships. It's now the next stage beyond that. There's lots of little robots that do specific things. And yeah, there's a lot of that. But yes, he's got an invisibility cloak, essentially, also predicting certain other stories that we won't mention. But th I think this is sort of the first hint that there's something else going on, that like this is not just high technology that this guy has found, because the man who reveals himself says his name is Jago J-Lo, which I think I, I think how are we going to say it? Although now that I say J-Lo, I'm like, I can't call him J-Lo. <laughs> he is not Jennifer Lopez. I was going Jago Jalo. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was just not sure. And also I could never actually, when I when I was taking notes about this, I just couldn't remember which order the names even came in. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, Jalo Jago half the time. Most of the, I really like most of the names in this book, but I, his name I did find a little annoying because I'm like, yeah, which, uh, I can't remember which ones, which, which order his names go in. They're so similar. It sounds like an obscure 90s recess snack. <laughs> 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 yes, it does. Yes, it does. But he's here because he knows that she has written this book, Continuous Creation, and is therefore an expert on the Spindle Kings, who are the main precursor civilization 
that humans know about. And they are the ones who supposedly um, terraformed a whole bunch of planets and made them suitable for life and were therefore kind of responsible for human history as well as the other intelligent races, or at least influenced it. And they have found various sites of them. They were quite large creatures with weird biology. There's some cool descriptions of them later on the book, which I'm sure we'll get to. And they also seemingly invented the strata machine technology. Although I think we actually later on find out that they got it from one of the other precursor races because we eventually find out that continuous creation is about the fact that the Spindle Kings disappeared mysteriously because they found out they were not the first creatures in the universe. There were a precursor race who precursed them, <laughs> if I can yep. use that as a verb. And then there was another one before them and another one before them all the way back to the creation of the universe. Get a grip, guys. Like, it's not a big deal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the humans can deal with it. You, you can deal with fragile. it. It's <laughs> a yeah. so wonder they did anything useful. Yes. Yeah. But he reckons he's found a new site that they must have built and it's full of really super advanced technology like nothing they've ever found before, including the invisibility cloak and also a thing that makes money, seemingly real money just out of nowhere. He's fabulously wealthy. He gives Kin like more money than she's ever made in her life. It just says, and you can keep that even if you don't come with me, but I want you to come with me. I love that that has an effect on the plot, right? Because the next thing that happens, like, you know, she finishes off the planet, takes about a month um, and they're packing it up. They've got a space elevator, which they call the line. And they call the space station at the top of the space elevator line top, which they use in a few different places. Lots of planets have one. You just travel line top to line top, which I thought was really interesting. So I was like, well, you would, wouldn't you? I mean, that makes it easy to get on and off the planet. But it also, as they say in the book, kind of reduces space travel to just sort of going between these little points like in a video game. Mm. Well, they make the very reasonable point that like it's way harder to design a ship that can both fly through space and get on and off a planet. Or not harder, but like resource inefficient mm. so yeah once you've got space elevators why would you ever need to land uh, yeah except of course they do as it turns out yeah <laughs> yeah a couple of times but yeah so she finishes that off and then welcomes the colonists and this is where you know she puts on her silvery weird skin and dresses up and looks a bit like a floating goddess type as the colonists arrive and they're being led by another oldster, which is the term they use for people who've had the longevity drugs and are now like over 100 or 200 years old. And she knows this guy and he's like, yeah, I'm going to stay with them for a while and sort of get them settled in. And he's like, but I might stay a bit longer because have you heard like the currency for the company has been destabilized? And I was so impressed that like what could have been just, a, I'm just going to give you more money than God and then I'm going to leave and I want you to come with me would just be like, this is amazing. I'm rich now. Instead is like, where's all this extra currency coming from? It's destabilizing the economy of the company and it's going to cause a crash. And people who've heard about this and they're starting to get worried because clearly this guy's been splashing his cash around. Yeah, I'm both fascinated and frustrated by this plot point only because I wanted to see where it went. And yes. we get it a couple of times at this point early in the story. And then we all bugger off to this mysterious technology site and never find out what actually happens. Because, I mean, yeah, again, yeah. could have been a whole other book about this <laughs> you know, capitalist mega monopoly falling apart. Yeah. Yeah. And I would read that. It's very interesting. Yeah. I mean, there could have been a sequel to this book about all of the consequences of their trip to the disc, which is where they're going to go. I think, I think, listener, you probably yeah. <laughs> gathered this is what's going on. because to be so subtle about that. Yeah. Because Jago does say the place that he's found is a flat earth. But Ken has been thinking about his offer while she's been finishing the job. And after she's welcomed the settlers, she returns to the line where she meets and has dinner with one of her many ex-husbands. Because, you know, she's there for 200 years. She's had a lot of husbands. That's fine. And he's decided to become the sleeper. So he, like, goes to the top of the line. They're going to retract the line. So they're going to remove the space elevator. But the space station will still be in orbit observing the planet just to make sure nothing goes wrong. And also so they can make contact with them when the civilization that they established there get space flight and they're ready to rejoin wider humanity. But they put someone in cryogenic suspension there. And this old ex-husband of hers is like, yeah, I'm volunteering for it. And she's a little bit, why? <laughs> Not you. You guys, you could be doing so many other more interesting things. I could have missed this, but like, how does he know when to wake up? Or is it just X amount of time? That's when they should have developed this technology by then. And here I am. No, I think it's a little bit Star Trek-y, like they have systems that monitor the planet for signs of technology. It's a bit like the Prime Directive in Star Trek. It's like if you've developed warp technology, which means you can travel to other planets, 
then we can contact you because you're going to meet other people anyway. But if you haven't yet, that's like the sort of technology level. So there's something like that in there. I haven't seen Star Trek. I'm sorry. There's too much of it. I don't know where to start. <laughs> I don't know why I'm gasping. I haven't seen most of Star Trek either. Yeah. That's it's fine. intimidating. It looks good, but... <laughs> I can tell you any of the good bits that you want to know. <laughs> I've watched too much of it. Uh, there's just the episode where Data gets a cat. I know that, and that's about it. Yep. Oh, he has that cat for a long time. Good to know. Maybe I will watch it. But yeah, I was I was fascinated. Again, the sort of entire side plot thing that we don't stick with, which is this idea that, yeah, they're creating these planets and people are coming down. And like, I'm assuming the reason Kin is all silver and glorious is so that as the settlers forget where they came from, it'll become some kind of creator god myth. So they're expecting them to essentially go back to complete technological uh, and, and they don't bring any technology with them either is a thing, isn't it? Or they bring very little. Yeah, they bring enough to get themselves established, but not enough to like continue it on. And that, that kind of comes up later in the book where when they're stranded on the disc, Marco's like, well, we could like rebuild technology and we could build our own spaceship, right? And one of the others is like, no, we, we think we could, but we couldn't do that. Like we don't have the resources and the infrastructure and the complete knowledge to make that happen. Yeah, we use those things. We think we understand them, but we couldn't actually just build them from first principles. So, yeah, so they're seeing these planets that they're obviously intending to go back to a very basic level of technology and then slowly work their way up, having completely forgotten where they came from. Mm. And then when they do finally get space flight, a human who has at that point been asleep for presumably thousands of years is just casually going to wake up and be like, oh, hey, no, actually, we've been here waiting for you all along. Welcome. Welcome back to society. What's that like for them? What's that like for him? Because how, like, mm, yeah, you know, is the rest of the human race even still out there at that point? This could be thousands of years later. Well, this is the point, right? And they, they kind of reveal this later in the book. And I, I get where you're coming from, that there are a lot of little things that he sets up that are amazing ideas. And it could have been a whole book and, and he sort of moves on. And that's not really what the book's about. But I kind of love that, and that there's this rich universe painted in this book that we don't fully explore, but we can kind of now is in our imagination. But they do establish later on the point of this project that the company is doing is to make sure that humanity survives by spreading them out thinly, but also putting them on different worlds and letting them evolve their societies in different ways independently so that they are diversified and thereby stronger and better able to survive. And I guess it's kind of like what he does in the first Discord novels. Like he throws all of these ideas out there and doesn't pick up some of them until much later books. And I guess in some ways... It could have been a toss of a coin whether this was the series or Discord was the series because it's just what took off or what grabbed his imagination. So I guess it's a precursor in different ways. It's a glimpse into the alternative Discworld. Yeah, Yeah. no, fully. I think that is very much his early style, a mind full of concepts just throwing them all out there. But it still annoys me to not have them completed. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's fair enough. Did not annoy me, but I totally get why, why it would be like a bit of grit in one of your teeth uh, to other people reading the book. And that's what fanfic is for. Exactly, exactly. I bet there's some great, actually, I don't know if there's great Strata fanfic out there. There's probably a little bit somewhere, but it's a bit of a niche book, so maybe. <laughs> but anyway, so he sort of gets through that and is like, okay, right, what am I going to do with my life? And again, it's a recurring theme that oldsters, because they've lived such a long life, They get bored really easily because they've done everything. So they start living very exciting lives where they just do things that are risky because they're like, well, I don't know. I don't care. I've done everything. I'll do this thing that might kill me. It'll be fun and interesting. And that is part of the reason she decides that she is going to go on this mission. So she follows the instructions and she goes to the line top of planet Kung, which is where the Kungs live because people have got to be named after their planets. Um, Earthens. As it, as it happens. And I do, look, I wonder, I had no problem with the name Kung as a, like a species. I'm like, this is fun. This is cool. I like it. And then there was a joke later on the book where I'm like, did you call them Kungs just for this one pun? And if so, hat off to you, Pratchett. <laughs> like, <laughs> Tell us the pun. That's great. Uh, the pun is when uh, much later in the book, they're able to summon food that they remember from back home. Kin does it first and summons like some sort of thing from a restaurant from her youth. And Marco, who's the Kung who we're about to meet in the plot, looks at that and goes, hey, can you, can you, I'm thinking of this specific dish. It's from this place on earth that I used to go to. It was a Kung food bar. And 
<laughs> I'm like, that's the that's the pun. That's the reason they're called Kungs, isn't it, Pratchett? Yeah. yeah. It was good, though. I didn't see it coming, and then I laughed quite <laughs> out loud, I think. Um, but, yeah, so she goes to Kung, and she's in the space station, and here we encounter one of many, many jokes that will resurface in the Discworld books because the bar at Kung Line Top is called the Broken Drum. Why? Because you can't beat a broken drum. <laughs> yeah. You can't beat it. And, you know, it will come back in the very next book that he writes, in fact, and then stick around for the rest of time in the disc world. Yes. Including getting mended. But there's lots of little jokes and moments like that in this book. There's there's so many, but I, I didn't mind. It was like it's like seeing a picture of some old friends, like from before you met them. You know that feeling? Mm. And someone's like, yes, I like that. Here's me at high school. Look at me. I was such a dork. But you go, yeah, but I reckon we would have been friends in high school because I was a dork like that too. Here's a picture of me. And for me, those little jokes in this book were like that. Love that. Mm. But this is where we meet Marco, Marco Farfera, a Kung who believes he is human because of the Kung belief that when you're born, your body is inhabited by the nearest disincarnate soul and he was, because of a problem with the line on Earth, he was born on Earth, even though that wasn't the plan. And the Kungs believed this, or at least his parents believed this so hard that his father was willing to, and look, content warning, we're going to discuss this. Mm-hmm. Like it's a very brief reference to possible suicide and not treated particularly seriously, but his father believes it so hard that he's like, maybe I should kill myself so that my soul is available and goes into my son when he's born because I don't want him to be human. But they don't do that. They convince him not to do that. He stops from doing that. And so he's born on Earth, and that means his parents believe he is human in his soul, and they leave him behind on Earth to be adopted by humans and raised by humans, which is a bit rough. But this forms a very interesting part of Marco's psychology, which I look, I think... In some parts, the book is dealt with in interesting ways and other parts maybe is not really <laughs> that big a deal. But he believes he's human. It sort of surfaces and desurfaces as as it's interesting or not interesting for the plot, as far as I can tell a bit. But yes, yeah. he has definitely has some very Kung instincts. Yes. While yeah. still definitely believing himself that he is human. And the Kungs are described as kind of these very wiry but strong and virtually indestructible <laughs> um, the way that they, they – they're kind of like Klingons in a way, I guess, in modern Star Trek. Oh, no, I've made another Star Trek reference, people who've done <laughs> Star Trek. But they're very tough but very skinny and wiry. Um, and some of them, if they are sort of genetically predisposed or if they are altered a little bit to go that way, belong to a warrior caste, which means they have four arms, and Marco is one of them. He's got four arms. I love all the main characters in this book. I'm just going to say that up front. And I do like Marco. But what do you think? I like Marco a lot. I, I, You mentioned the four arms. I like there's a moment quite early on where they're getting to know each other and Kinara just says, so so why the four arms? Because this is not something that they all have. And he answers the question and then is just like, so why do you have no hair? And it's a really nice <laughs> moment of like, yeah, I can objectify you as well. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's not okay just being like, asking questions about my anatomy. Hmm. And is there a thing about like human women objectifying Kungs as well? Like that's like a, a thing that <sighs> happens. Oh that yeah. Section, I was like, oh, that's really weird. That was weird. And the fact that they described yeah, him as like prior pick. And I was like, Ooh, is that like, cause that really like impacted my, I was like, I'm going to not picture scenes. Yeah. yeah. It was the thing where like male Kungs specifically are extremely male to the point where they exude some, masculinity that even women from other species can't resist. resist. Yeah, it was a bit weird. It was, I mean, they, he does go it both ways, but I thought it was interesting from a sort of looking at it from a modern perspective that he sort of calls out Kungs and says that, because the direct quote is, Kung were directly polarised, male and female, with none of that subtle elision between the absolute male and absolute female psyches that humans possessed. Now, I think we all understand that is not how humans not quite how humans work, but at least he is acknowledging there that not everyone is like this sort of archetypal end of the gender spectrum, right? But Kungs are like that. And he's kind of contrasting them with humans. And it's clumsy language. Like we wouldn't write it that way today, obviously. And then, yes, he goes on to say, and some human women find Kung males irresistible as a result. And you're like, that's that's a weird conclusion to draw, but okay, sure. But yeah, I thought that was interesting in a sort of a way that he's sort of acknowledging there's a spectrum of gender in humans, but not quite. 
Definitely, yeah. I mean, it it definitely made me squirm a bit. And I mean, I'm non-binary and yeah, had some feels about that. Like, I yes. definitely would have preferred that particular section was just not in the book, really. Like, it, Yeah. And it really is there just for that gag. Like, none of the things yeah. about Marco that make a difference on the disc or during their adventure are that. No. I mean, he is a very aggressive character. He's a very... Mm. Mm forceful character and they've kind of set it up here to be like partly that's because he's male and Mm. that yeah we could have done without i feel but then in the rest of the book like the way that it's described it's more like that's just part of kung society like they talk about how when humans first made contact with kungs they were like well we don't need any weapons like we'll just send five people down we'll make peaceful contact and then it's like five corpses later (laughs) the humans realize that they were really peaceful in the galactic scale of things peaceful contact Uh, because they kind of position humans as much less violent than kung society but much more violent than shand society with a couple of you know interesting twists exceptions Mm. so yeah so it was weird that that was in there for a bit of a a gag which doesn't really go anywhere and then Mm. Yeah, so I agree. We could have done without it. But I do like Marco, kind of like Silver, who's the other character we'll meet in a moment. They're the only representative of their whole species that we meet, really. Well, I mean, there's a Kung tending the bar and there's a boat Kung who drives them on a boat to get to the spaceship they're about to go to, but we don't really meet them. So they're kind of the one representative of a whole species. So it's hard to know how individual they really are. But I I got a feeling like I knew who he was and I knew who Silver was. Mm. In some ways, I felt like they honestly had more characterization than Kin did, which I yeah. really enjoyed. Kin felt like a bit of a audience cipher where she was observing a lot and giving commentary on stuff, but from a very, like, this is how we're supposed to interpret things kind of way. Whereas both Marco and Silver, we got a sense of really their personalities. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, in some ways, they honestly felt more human, as a way to put it, than, than Kin did, which I thought was fascinating. Yeah. We meet Marco and they talk about how he's been hired also for this job. He's going to be the pilot to fly them to this site that Jago has found. And before they leave, um, Kin has to sign a few copies of the book. Um, We meet the one other species we'll meet in the book apart from the main characters, which is the Eft, who I thought were really interesting, (laughs) like really weird. Although they... The visual description made me think of kind of like a Muppet version of Cousin It from the Adams Family because it's just like this sort of shaggy pile of fur with one foot and some tentacles underneath somewhere. You were talking before about the the Kung and whether that name was purely for pun purposes. I did notice that like the Eft were just the Eft until they had the opportunity to talk about something being ethnic. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, "Mm -hmm." I see what you did there. (laughs) I also thought, and I don't think this possibly could have been on purpose because of when it was written, but they're renowned for being the mathematical and mercantile society. Like their bank is the big bank and they don't have computers because of the way their society and technology work. So they they do all their mathematics by getting lots and lots of Fs to do the thing together. And it, I kept thinking, is this a joke about EFT, electronic funds transfer? And I'm like, no, it can't be because Australia is the only place that uses that term and they wouldn't have been using it in 1981, but it works so well. Wait, um, are we the only ones who know. use that term? It's just such a straightforward term. Yeah, I don't think, certainly FPOS, I don't think is widely used outside of Australia. No. Huh. But, I mean, yesterday I realized that budgies are an Australian thing. I think it's a technical term that you might find in documentation and things. But I think Australia is like the only place that uses it in general language. That's my understanding. Listener, if you're from somewhere outside Australia, please tell me if I'm wrong. But we call it an FPOS machine, uh, which is an acronym for Electronic Funds Transfer Point of Sale. I'm amazed you knew that. And EFT is just Electronic Funds Transfer. And, And we also have much wider use of those things than a lot of countries do. So that's my impression is it's not a widely used term. But yes, they Kin signs a few more books in various different forms. I love the Eft book is a touch book made out of knotted string. Oh, that was nice. Yeah, but she has her own personalized knot for her signature, which is excellent. Yeah. Clearly dealt with this before. Another thing about the Efts, and I, I, we won't go on about it because this is the only scene where we meet them, and they're mentioned a couple of other times, but green shading to indigo is this Eft's name, which suggests that they do perceive color and they can see but then they use touch books, which sort of indicates that they don't use vision as a primary sense. 
And then they also can't speak naturally. They have like a voice box machine that they use to talk. So I was like, oh, this is really like, there's a lot of interesting ideas going on with them. And again, we never find out more about them, but I'm like, great. Like, it does make me wonder whether like color is another language for them, maybe one that they wouldn't use to put down concepts, the kind you'd use in a book, but they would use to name a child. Hmm. Having shades of Becky Chambers' Wayfarer series there, if anyone has read that, where one of the species involves literally their main form of communication is colour patches on their cheeks, sort of chromatophore style that they can turn into enough different combinations of colours that they've got a whole language built on it. But there isn't any reference to that in there. I just The colour name made me wonder. So after all this signing of weird books, they are about to go down to the planet. But before that happens, the reason that the Eft and the Barkung come over to them is that they've found a raven in a weird transparent box on the space station. And they're like, is this yours? <laughs> I know the, the scene was kind of weird because they're like, why, why are you asking us? Um, but then they decide to adopt it. And there's this great bit where Marco talks about how pets are psychological symbionts or something like that. And like, I was like, oh, that's a nice way to describe it. It was very interesting. Yes, it's this weird thing that humans do, having pets. Yeah. And this is, this is, I love this about his character. He thinks he's human, but he also constantly talks about how weird humans are. Yeah. Which, I mean, look, me too. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Hard, hard saying, Marco. Yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah, I don't think the raven was in a box when they found it, just to be nitpicky. I think they. Well, they put it in a box. I think that was what they put it in to keep. I think it was just running around on the station. Right. But yeah. That makes sense. Uh, that raven will become important later. <laughs> Was the bird happy about that or was it raven mad? Sorry. <laughs> oh. No. No. Oh. <laughs> you look far too happy about that joke. Don't crow about it. No. no. <laughs> Birds of a feather. <laughs> hey. No. It's, it's all now. foul play from here. Oh. <laughs> What's happening? It's for Quick, alarm. let's get on the lift and go down to the planet Kong. <laughs> Uh, which they do. They go down there. They get Ben's driven getting in a flap. They get driven in a boat by another kung to a weird spaceship that's shaped like a donut. And it, I mean, it's it's not that weird. It's just an interesting spaceship. They recognize it as a standard model, but it is described as sort of being donut shaped and having a lot of room in a cargo hold. I thought it was cool. In the book that this book is referencing, is their spaceship shaped like a disc, and they're going to a world shaped like a donut? It's like. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, you know, I can't remember. I want to know now. Their spaceship is called the Lying Bastard in Ringworld, but I don't remember what what it looks like. I'd have to look that up. Mm. But that that would be funny. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, they board the spaceship, uh, which is where they meet the third member of the expedition, Silver, who is a giant. Like I think she's like eight feet tall or something. She's very big, bear like, shaggy creature with big tusks who's very frightening when they first meet her, but then turns out to be very nice. And she is a Shand. She says her name is unpronounceable by humans. I love that as a trope. In fact, I think she says it's specifically like 23 syllables long or something like that, but you can call me Silver. And so that's what we call her. And she, she's great. I, I love Silver so much. Silver is my favorite character. She's just, she's lovely because she's this giant predator looking thing, but she is an intellectual and she is absolutely like the most thoughtful and reflective of the main characters. Yeah. Yeah. I love just the things we learn about Shan society too. Like we don't learn a lot about Kung society. We learn a lot about Kung biology and psychology, but we don't really learn much about what their society is like, apart from like a couple of cool stories that Marco tells. But we do learn a fair bit about Shan society, including that most of them have a lot of jobs, like they do many different things. So Silver is introduced as a sociologist, comparative historian, linguist, and meat animal herder, <laughs> which seems to be a kind of standard thing among Shans because they talk about somebody else who's a Shan having a bunch of jobs as well. It's the gig economy. <laughs> It's amazing she has any free time to go off on an expedition to another planet. I mean, look, I, as as someone who often is described as a slashy or multi-hyphenate, um, I definitely identified with this. It was great. But she is a, an historian and a linguist and a sociologist, so she understands human society and, in fact, knows more about human history and culture than Kin Arad does, which I thought was really interesting because she's lived most of her life off the planet Earth. She was born there, I think it is established, and a lot of her early memories are from there, but she's spent a lot of time working for the company, making other planets, flying around the universe. So, yeah, she doesn't know that much about human history. 
And Silver also, like, just little things, like, she, they're, they're speaking. <laughs> it's described that Kin has to like, stick two fingers in her mouth to speak the Shand language because they have to speak around these massive tusks that they have. And so they're trying to speak Shand and Marco doesn't speak it. So Kin's having to sort of translate between that and all speak, which is the human designed universal language. Of course, humans designed it. And I think this is also the first time we get a sense that part of the, I think it's not just Marco. I think it is the sort of Kung standard psychology is to be quite paranoid. So the fact oh, yeah. that they're speaking this language Marco can't understand immediately makes him wildly suspicious. Yes, that is his sort of defining thing. Like it keeps coming up. He's paranoid all the time, which does lead to the old joke of like, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Mm-hmm. But Silver has had her tusks modified so she can unscrew them and take them out and speak other languages because she's a linguist. And it's seen as a little bit shameful to not have tusks, like a punishment for criminals on Shand is to remove their tusks permanently. But, you know, she can put hers back in. That was really interesting. I just love everything about her. I love that detail. I thought that was a great detail. She's like, yeah, this is a practicality for me. Don't look at me like that. Mm. Because also they're described as being like intricately carved as well. Like they've got like, Mm. which seems to be like a a, either a personal or a familial thing. Like there's lots of little details that you're like, oh, so we don't get all of the details. Like we're not told everything, but we get so much that we really feel like these people are from different cultures and different species. Which is also a recurring theme in the book. The characters talk about and think about the fact that particularly humans think about aliens as kind of like humans wearing different hats, which is very much how one of my history professors talked about the way we think about human history. He called it the Disney theory of history, which is people in the past were just like us, except they wore weird hats. And he's like, no, they thought differently. They had different ideas about how the world worked. Their psychology was different as a result. There's also a fascinating theme that is never deeply explored in the book, but is definitely touched on a few times where, like, although there are different alien species that are clearly part of this galactic civilization, there is just this repeated hint that humans kind of run the show. And I mean, Mm. fascinating precursor to extremely spoilery end of the book stuff. But like, yeah, there's definitely references to like, the one that I wrote down here was a, a reference to later on. If dumb waiters were able to fail, dumb waiters are these like food generators, basically. If they could fail, you humans would never have allowed the shand into space. Yeah, you know, and someone else talks about you know humans just seem to run the universe now, and it's 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 very interesting. Yeah, well, for reasons that the book will go into, they were the first species to be spacefaring or at least the first modern species, like they were the precursors, but then of the current generation of intelligent species, the humans were the first one to invent spaceships and go out into space. And I think they invented the matrix drive, or at least they were the first to make it work properly. Mm. And it's because, as we'll find out, Kinarad's Earth is not our Earth. It is an alternate history and quite a different one. And it's not just the Earth that's different, it's the solar system that the Earth is in that is different as well. And that is a big part of why it's explained their history is so different. So, yeah, it's I found all that stuff pretty interesting. But, yeah, you're right. It is one of those stories where, well, the humans are in charge. And I think that is maybe a point of difference from the ring world where the most advanced species are these creatures called the puppeteers. And Mm. that's who comes and offers the human main character the job of going to investigate the ring world. Whereas here, the humans are in charge. So that might be a bit of a a flip around. But it was one of the things that I enjoyed around the fact that we get a lot of conversation just between Marco and Silver and we sort of get their personalities a lot more is their, their observations on living under not exactly human rule, but certainly human domination. Hmm. Yeah, I really enjoyed that as a minor thread through the book. Mm. Yeah, because it's also, I don't think it's explicitly said anywhere, but it's implied that the other species just live on their own planets, whereas it's humans who are like, we've got to make other planets and live on them. Yeah, I mean, the other species clearly travel because, like, Marco's parents were living on Earth. Yeah, or at least visiting. And he's a pilot. But I don't think they have this urge to go out and make a bunch of new planets for themselves. Yeah, But yeah, so we meet Silver. That's great. And then not long after they meet Silver, they're like, well, what is this? Like, why are we on this spaceship? What's the deal with this mysterious expedition? And they look in the hold and realize there's plenty of space to carry stuff, but some of that space is already occupied by a bunch of small weaponry. And Kin puts two and two together and goes, hold on, this isn't an archaeological site where we can just find stuff and take it. There's people there. This guy wants us to go to this place 
and there's people living there and he wants to steal their stuff with violence if necessary. And she's like, I don't like this. And just as they're about to leave, Jago shows up with a gun and basically says, no, you're all coming with me, even you two aliens. And he's quite xenophobic. Because as oh, hugely. One of the things we haven't revealed about him is that he's a thousand years old. Like he's from the early part of Earth's spacefaring civilization where they sent out these like slower than light spaceships with cryogenically frozen pilots to explore the universe. And then, you know, technology caught up. But he was the pilot of one of these and his ship crashed into the flat Earth that they're going to investigate. And that's why he found it. But it's also why he's sort of got these very old fashioned views. And he's like, I just looked up a computer and asked it to find me a pilot and a sociologist and an archaeologist. I didn't know two of you wouldn't be human. And he's he's a real dick about it. <laughs> like, I don't like him at all. It's like, hey, he gets his. He does get his. There's a moment there where he refers to them as Bems and it says that like only Silver understood the reference. And I reading that, I was like, I, I don't understand the reference, which I think is, again, just one of those things where reading in the 80s as a sci-fi fan you probably would have apparently that's bug-eyed monsters right oh yeah yeah Um, but yeah i had to go and google it that was a big thing in early doctor who like the producer sydney was like we won't have any bams no bug-eyed monsters Mm. and then the second story had daleks (laughs) that were hugely successful and just totally destroyed that but yeah he also refers to them uh, this happens a couple of times in the book but he also refers to them as a frog and a bear which just made me absolutely 100 sure that was a muppets reference like, they are Kermit and Fozzy. And Fozzy. <laughs> Gone on a road trip. Huh. Uh, <laughs> and their personalities are not at all the same. I guess you could argue Marco is a bit anxious, and that is a Kermit trait. But, yeah. The demon that they meet later on also refers to them as a frog and a bear. So it's kind of a, yeah. My brain just pictured Marco doing the Kermit flail. And if Marco does the Kermit flail, several people are going to die. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it never should be. Absolutely. But yeah, he he threatens them at gunpoint. He's got this like needle gun and says, this is a blah, blah, blah. He does the Dirty Harry thing. Like this is a blah, blah, blah gun. And, uh, you know, and he also says something, which I'm sure I couldn't find a specific reference, but I'm sure Pratchett uses it in one of the later Discworld books where he says, you know, you could all rush me and sure, one of you might get me, but how many of you will die first? And I'm sure, I'm sure Vimes or someone says that in mm. one of the later Discworld books. I think you're right. But before he can shoot anybody, the raven appears screams in his face and he just dies. Marco rushes him, but he doesn't actually get to lay a finger on him. Turns out he's died of a heart attack. And then the raven kind of disappears. And it takes a while. Like there's a couple of good little hints where the raven is there. Like at one point it shouts his name when they're on the way to the spaceship. It shouts Jago and no one like goes, what? But I think they kind of assume it must have belonged to him and he's left it behind. And then there's a scene a little bit later on where Kin's wandering around the spaceship nude because, you know, she's in the future and nobody cares about being naked. I thought that was a nice kind of not particularly heavy handed thing where she finds the cage it was in is destroyed. And she's like, hang on a minute. How did this happen? Yeah. Is she in the future though or is she in the past? That's the, the whole thing, isn't it? Get there. Yeah. This is a good question. I referenced earlier that those apprentices at the start weren't the only characters that I thought we were going to get more of. Jago Jalo's <laughs> I know. sudden writing out of the plot just completely threw me. As someone who sort of has developed certain expectations about fiction and what things are going to mean in fiction, he was set up to be so important at the start. And obviously he did drive the plot even in absence, but mm. the fact that he died and then was immediately put in a cryo chamber and we literally have Kin saying, oh, yeah, He's lucky it was a heart attack. This is the kind of thing we can easily bring people back from. Mm. So I was like, oh, so they're going to bring him back at some point. And then later on, just to slightly spoiler, when they have to abandon ship, they even make a point of taking the cryopod with them. And I'm like, yeah, so he's going to come back later. You never hear about the cryopod again. He never comes back. It was just completely threw me. This is a bit of a tangent, but I basically, same as you, I spent the whole time being like, okay, when are they going to revive him? And I kept picturing it as the Pokemon Revival Center, like with his like, little pod, like putting him on the conveyor belt and just jiggle it, and there he is. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, even after they left the cryopod behind, I was sure that that meant he was going to reappear at a dramatic moment, having revived off screen, and nope, nope. Oh, like, wow. it, was, it was Chekhov's cryopod, but they never fired it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mind that so much because I, I thought that too when they first put him on ice and they're like, yeah, we could bring him back from this. I thought, okay, well, that means something. And then 
he just sort of disappears. I think the smaller ship that they eject from the rest of the ship does get destroyed. So I think he does get completely killed. Mm, But fully off screen. But fully off screen. Yeah, like we don't see it happen. They just sort of comment on it. But I kind of got to a point where I was like, I think that was deliberate. I think that's setting up like, oh, you think you know what's going to happen, but no, that's not what's going to happen. I I dug that a little bit. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I'm not necessarily saying I minded it so much as that it was one of a couple of cases where I felt like, I don't know, possibly this is just the difference of being a reader in the 2020s versus a reader in the 80s, but there are certain, I feel like I'm a very trope savvy reader. So there are certain Mm. things where if they're set up, I expect things to go a certain way and authors can use that very cleverly to set up an expectation and then subvert it. And this didn't feel like that. It felt like just a thing that didn't happen. Mm. But possibly that is just a difference in the timing, or possibly it is, you know, he was a very early to his writer game at that point. You know, yeah. it's the kind of thing that makes those earlier books feel very different from the later books where it just feels so polished and so everything is meaningful. Mm. And like, I, I hate to keep being like, what if he was setting it up for a series? But maybe like, if it had been a series, <laughs> he would have just like popped up, like, he would have survived that off screen death and he would have been a character that could pop up in another book in this series. Mm. I don't think he ever thought about writing a series of this. Like it seems clear from things that he said at the time that he immediately moved on to, like, I really like this flat earth idea, but I've got another thing I'm going to write about that and I'm going to do it in a different way. I think Mm. he immediately sort of moved on to that. So I I don't think that was ever in his mind, but I agree that if he was, yeah, that might've been where he took it. Mm. Mm. But they continue on. There's a bit of shenanigans. Marco uses the matrix drive from in the atmosphere, like while it's still on the planet and that surprises everyone. And I mentioned that mostly because I just want to talk about the idea of soul lag, which I loved. Mm. It's so cool. Like they, they use this matrix drive, which flies them through a place called elsewhere. That's like the strata universe's version of hyperspace. But it's like whatever your soul is doesn't quite arrive at the same time as you, <laughs> your physical body. And so... Yes, souls have a speed limit. Yeah. I love the idea that souls have a speed limit and it's, you know, it's a very high speed, but it's not quite as high as we can fly now. Yeah. And there was a great, like when he takes off from the planet, when Marco flies and Kin's not expecting it, she's sort of mid thought. And then there's this great parenthetical where it says a few seconds of vertigo and eternity of despair, (laughs) which is what it feels like to fly through elsewhere. And I was like, oh, that's so good. And it just made it it gave you the same effect as any other sort of space travel in another book, but it just felt different, which I just really liked. I don't think that's a direct reference to Ringworld or anything else. It feels like a very Pratchett thing to have come up with. Yeah. Just, again, a cool detail. Yeah, but I think also significant to the twist that we'll get to towards the end of the book, Mm. potentially setting that up a little bit. But they go into space, you know, they start to get to know each other a bit and they have a bit of argy-bargy. There's a great bit where Silver, like, comes into the room after Marco's taken off and is like, if you ever do that again, I will kill you. And Marco sort of of clocks that and goes, noted. (laughs) And you're like, oh, okay. (laughs) Great. Love it. Uh, And it's just a matter of fact for them, which is one of the many times where they behave a little bit in a way that would say a lot about a human personality, that there's something maybe not quite right with them. But for these characters, because they're aliens, like they do, they have a different perspective. They're just different. I love that. But they fly to the disc. Along the way, Kin works out, you know, while she's padding around naked, she's like, well, this raven has escaped itself, it seems. that I don't know that that's okay. So they vent the ship and try to send it into space. but unbeknownst to them, it survives and hangs on inside. And it, it's very much implied at this point that the raven is significantly more than it seems on the outside. I mean, first of all, it appears to have melted through this box. Yeah. And then later on, they don't know, but the reader knows that the way it escaped the ship being vented was by literally finding a emergency air chamber, essentially, letting itself in. And there's, a, there's an image of it just hanging on to the handle to keep yeah. the... Um, I think keep the air flowing or keep the door closed. And like, yeah, it's clearly no mere raven. Yeah. I just, I love the raven. The raven was cool. They fly then to the disc and they've, they've managed to see some little videos that Jayla has shot from when he was there before, which show like sea monsters and dragons and weird shit that they're like, 
there's a great line where they say, I think there's some really weird stuff going on on this planet, or he's a really good at special effects. And I'm like, it's the future. <laughs> and anyway, surely, <laughs> unfortunately, by that time, surely anyone could type into the future mid journey equivalent, uh, generate some dragons, and it would come up with something that looked a bit shit, but kind of did the job. We'll come back to that as a topic, I think, when we get to the questions. That was interesting, but they, they make it there and they find the disc. It takes them a bit of time to find it when they arrive because it's not quite what they're expecting. Um, it's not huge. I think they do they do give its diameter at some point and it's like in thousands of miles or 10,000 miles or something like that, but it's not like the size of a whole normal planet. Continent-wise, it's got like half of the sort of Earth on it, but it's missing the Americas. It's missing an entire sort of hemisphere. Yeah, it's just got like sort of Europe mostly. Europe and the Middle East – and it's not quite clear if it's got any of Asia. Us. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know. <laughs> no, we're not there. <laughs> no, it's, it's like, I feel like if there was a map of this earth, it would end up on that Reddit, which is maps without New Zealand. Have you seen, have you yeah. seen that? <laughs> I like, had not, but amazing. Oh, they just find all these maps in like TV shows and films and video games and stuff that have the world on them, but they just leave out New Zealand. And often a lot of them leave out Tasmania as well. It's quite interesting. <laughs> But anyway, they find the planet and it's like, yeah, it's a flat disc with a dome over the top. You can't quite see through it, but they find that there's a hole in it and they try to fly through the hole and something crashes into them and severely damages their ship. And in fact, they have to abandon most of the ship and just take the sort of little command module out of it and leave the rest of it behind. But unfortunately, then that also gets damaged as they crash into something else. And Kin is the one who says, I have a bad feeling about what that thing is that crashed into us. And they realize that on the inside of the dome, it's you can't see outside of it. And it has fake stars and planets moving around on the inside of the dome to simulate what the Earth's sky would look like. And one of those planets is what crashed into the ship and damaged it. I love that they make the point too, that this is quite a feat of technology, not just because you know they've got to have all this stuff up here and moving, but because to make the planets move in a way that would cause someone on the surface to see it the way that we would on the surface of the Earth. They have to get retrograde orbits in there. Yeah. So the, the planets aren't just circling. They're literally backtracking on themselves. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like a giant orrery. It's amazing. <laughs> like there's definitely a recurring theme here where they're going, this is an incredible feat of technology to do something that they re- – why? Yeah. Why would anyone use all this technology to do this – really weird specific thing yeah 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 uh it's so it's so weird and there's a moment before they crash and they sort of get inside the dome and they're sort of still floating just outside the edge of the disc because the first thing that hits them is a ship like they run into like a ship that's gone over the edge of the disc and they find like a person on it who's dead and they're like this is nuts and they analyze that yeah, person like a sailing like, ship, not a spaceship yeah 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 and they're like it's a human person on it but they're like they've frozen and died in space because they've gone off the edge of the disc and then they yeah crash into the planet. They have to abandon the whole ship at that point and that's when they abandon JLo's body in the cryotube, which they took with them in the little ship, and they take instead a dumbwaiter, which, as you said before, is kind of like a replicator in Star Trek. Like it can make anything out of raw materials on a small scale and it's implied nothing too complicated, like chemical compounds and artificial food. Yes, it does make timber at one point, boards of timber, but they can't get it to make like a spaceship engine or or something like that. But they take it with them because Silver, the Shand, can't eat the same kind of proteins that humans and Kungs can. Uh, And it seems like this world does have human edible and Kung edible food on it, but also Shands can't go without food. They have to eat proteins from their home world, which includes eating each other as they sometimes do after a ritual combat. But if they don't eat after only like a couple of days, they go into this sort of feral hunger rage state. And because they're otherwise quite calm and peaceful creatures, they really don't like that. And again, really didn't think we'd have to talk about uh, suicide quite so much uh, in this episode, but they would often rather die than into that state and hurt other people. Can I have a nature nerd moment? Please. This this fascinated me. And I mean, you know, I am not an evolutionary biologist. I am absolutely an amateur of this. But like I could absolutely see that being a trait that could survive the evolution of intelligence. I can definitely see a scenario where, you know, a species has this survival trait where essentially, yeah, if they get hungry enough, they'll just eat anything. 
And you can sort of imagine, even as they're becoming more intelligent and developing consciences, the ones that would rather starve than do this are the ones that aren't going to reproduce. And so you can sort of see this becoming something that does evolve with them into intelligence. I mean, it does raise the question of why they haven't found some kind of, say, medical intervention that means that they can prevent it. But for the sake of the characters, it is really interesting. And yeah, I felt totally plausible. Yeah. And I loved it as that being the reason there's danger here and they have to keep this dumb waiter safe because if they don't, Silver's going to go. Mm, it's great stakes. Yeah. I was um thinking, I read this in a book recently, like a similar plot where like everyone is friends, but one of them has a specific food need. And if they don't have that food need met, then they're going to go like off the charts sort of thing. I was like, what book was it? Was it a Terry Pratchett book? And then like, while we were talking, I realized it was Madagascar, the musical, the stage play. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's the, the lion. Oh my god! Yes. Because <laughs> it's the lion. I um, was like, I have to eat regularly, and I have to eat meat. And the only meat around was his friends. And they're like, Well, how are we going to deal with this situation? So yeah. <laughs> Madagascar was a really dark movie when you stop to think about yeah. it. God. Yeah. Sounds it. <laughs> But look, this starts their adventure on the disc. And again, this parallels the plot of Ringworld because on Ringworld, they go to the Ringworld, they arrive there. The Ringworld has like active defenses to stop it from being hit by meteorites and that damages their ship. And then they run into basically a line holding up. The Ringworld's really weird. Like it's got on the inside of the ring, it's got these long, like sort of space elevator style lines holding up these massive sails that create day and night because there's gaps in them and they rotate around. So as one passes overhead, it's nighttime. And then as it keeps going, it's daytime. And they run into one of the strings holding one of those up and it crashes their ship. And then they decide to go to the edge of the ring to see if there's technology there that can help them with their ship. Here, it's kind of the reverse. They start at the edge and Marco's got a map and identifies that, well, you know, this looks like Europe, but there's this perfectly circular bit in the middle that shouldn't be there. Clearly, that's where the builders are going to be. We should go there and see what's going on. And along the way, the first thing that happens is they meet some Vikings, basically. <laughs> um, a long ship full of Viking-like humans, but not just any Viking-like humans. Um, as they kind of save them from going over the edge of the disc, they realize one of the people on this Viking longship is none other than Leif Erikson, <laughs> famous human from Earth. But it's clearly not the original. But this is where we find out the big difference between Kin's homeworld and this Earth. And the disc's history is the one that resembles our human history from the real world, from around about 1000 AD. Whereas on Kin's homeworld, Leif Erikson went somewhere in North America, which is something that probably did happen in our world. Um, there's a bit of debate about where exactly he went and other things about his life, but it seems pretty clear that he did actually find America. Well, he didn't discover it. Obviously, people were already there, but he <laughs> found it possibly in Canada. And in Kin's world, he settled there, spread around the continent. And instead of just becoming, as they describe it, another tribe of Native Americans, like integrating with the local people, they kind of join forces and become a new nation, and they call it Valhalla. And after 400 years or something, they have already developed like steamships and cannons, and they go back to Europe and invade. <laughs> and I'm like, this is nuts, but I kind of love it. Mm. And these are some ideas too, like not the specific history, but the idea of calling America Valhalla and some of the other little details are things that come back in the Long Earth books where some of the Earths are different to the original Earth, and there's a whole string of them they call the Valhalla Belt, where it's a little bit like this history. Just coming back briefly to the topic of like how many different spin-off books you could write about parts of this that didn't happen, <laughs> I would love to see someone who could do it well write an entire um, series about people whose cultural background is Norse Native American and who are now the dominant power on Earth. Like, yeah, That would be amazing. I would read the heck out of that. Yeah. They don't go into a lot of detail about it apart from this bit where they kind of describe his history. And they do, like, they have an alternate version of the famous Columbus rhyme uh, instead of, like, in 1400 and whatever it is. They have, uh, in the year 322, Ericsson sailed the ocean blue. And we know that Ericsson lived at about 1000 AD, which is the time that the disc seems to be stuck at. So I can only imagine that means that they have a different way of telling the years in Kin's world, which makes sense because they also don't know what Christianity is. 
Like mm, when they encounter yeah. it on the disc, they're like, what is this weird religion? Well, who are all these Christers, as they call them? And they have no idea. So I guess, you know, on their world, the Norse gods become dominant or they abandon religion altogether or who knows, but it's a very mm. different history. Yes, it's it's slightly tragic to me that, I mean, it makes sense that Kin is divorced enough from Earth to not be particularly sort of, I guess, culturally Earthian. But yeah, I would have loved to see some of that. Yeah. We should point out Silver is the one who knows most of this stuff and mm. understands it and, in fact, can speak Latin. And at one point when they find someone else who speaks Latin, she sort of turns around and is like, what? I understand this language. Because <laughs> up until then, they're sort of, you know, doing a bit of a dumb show and figuring out what they mean. But I just kind of love that. But, I mean, this is what kicks off their adventures. And they most of the rest of the book is their adventure across the disc from the rim to the hub, if we use the modern disc world terms. They don't use those in this book quite, but they are going towards the center where there's this mysterious circular island. And they first, they have this adventure with the Vikings. They go on the longboat with them to their home and along the way fight and kill some dragons. <laughs> um, there's three of them. There's a great line where Kin says, the third dragon must have been the smartest. The smartest one always fights last. But yeah, between Marco and Silver, particularly, they kill all the dragons, which the Vikings are incredibly impressed by. They're like, "We, how did you do that? These, you're heroes. Hooray. And they already think of Kin as a bit of a god because they have these, and this is an important part of the plot, they have these flying belts as part of their survival suits. As a later plot point, they mention that they're supposed to be used in space. So in gravity, their power runs out a little bit quicker, but they should be able to get them all the way to the thing. And so she flies in to save them from the edge of the world, looking like a goddess. Yes, I was going to say, it's, it's worth noting that it's not just that they meet Leif Erikson and these Vikings, they literally meet them on Leif's famous journey to yes. during which they discover the Americas, except, of course, because there are no Americas, what they actually do is save them from sailing off the edge of the world. Yes. <laughs> Lovely Dita. So the history is clearly repeating itself, but is quite different. Because time is a flat circle. <laughs> yeah. It's not, and it's also not clear whether this is the only time that's happened or if there's some sort of weird cycle of history on the disc where things repeat themselves. Um, I, the way it's presented, I think, is just that we're meant to believe that they've just happened to have arrived at the time when Lee Erikson was about to go off the edge of the planet. And that's the only time it was happening on the disc. But it's lucky for them because they're like, wait a minute, this is from my history. This is weird. It's never explicitly explained how that works, but it's kind of explained by the end of the book, I think. But Yeah, we'll, it definitely feels like a don't overthink it moment. Yeah, um, for sure. But yeah. But there is more weird biology when they kill those dragons, EJ, because Silver was like, I want to know how this is possible that creatures evolved in an Earth-like atmosphere could breathe fire, because this makes no sense <laughs> to me. I mean, you say weird biology, but... I mean, the point is that it turns out to be weird technology. Well, does it? I mean, they describe it as being hot as a fusion engine, but I think they do imply that they are biological. They're just constructed biological creatures. That was how I read it anyway. Okay. Yeah, no, I might be misremembering that. Yeah. But, I mean, that is a form of technology, isn't it? So I'm splitting hairs there, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they, they're definitely constructed one way or another. They're, yeah. they're not evolved, which is a, like an important point. Yeah. The other thing they learned from the Vikings is that recently the stars and the planets and even the sun have been acting quite erratically. And just now one of the planets seems to have disappeared because, of course, it's been <laughs> smashed into <laughs> um, their spaceship. So clearly things have been going wrong on the disc already, and they see more evidence of this on their journey as they keep going. Kin also notes that one other big difference between this disc Earth and the Earth that Kin's from is that Venus doesn't have a massive moon the same size as itself called Adonis, which exists in her version of Earth's solar system. And there's a sort of a theory that Silver has that this is one of the reasons why humans were the first into space is that they always had this reminder in their night sky that the planets revolve around each other. And supposedly in Kin's timeline, they never thought that the Earth was the center of the universe. Like They always understood that things revolved around each other and that gave them a head start in terms of astronomy and space understanding. That's the implication anyway that I got out of that. Mm, yeah, definitely. Whereas these folks have a very medieval actual Earth understanding of the world, which is complicated by the fact that all their ideas are correct. <laughs> like, yes, I was going to say, they're right. So, yeah, the world really is flat and has dragons. So Yeah. But they meet the other Vikings and sort of make friends with them after a few misunderstandings. 
and then decide they're going to keep going towards the center of the disc flying over the sea where they see more monsters as like a sea serpent and an island which turns out to be a giant turtle that almost eats skin <laughs> that was that was great first giant turtle in Pratchett's writing <laughs> and they actually do refer to the turtles and the elephants at one point as well mm. where kin is the one who goes that's a stupid idea <laughs> what does the turtle breathe <laughs> as it's flying <laughs> through space because <laughs> she hasn't heard this idea before when silver tells her about it I mean, you've been doing this series on, on Discworld books for a very long time, so possibly this has come up before, but has anyone actually nature nerded at you about where the idea of a turtle carrying the world on its back comes from? You know, I don't think so. Why, that's the thing. So there is an actual species of turtle that burrows into the ground, and when it emerges, will often just have this chunk of sod <laughs> on its back. Oh, and yes. you can find amazing pictures of this online. I'll, yes. I'll send you something to put in your notes. Um, but you look at it, and yeah, you can absolutely see how – People looking at that would have gone, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we could be on one of those. Yeah. And that is thought to be where that idea comes from originally on this earth. That's cool. Which is just glorious to me. There's one picture of one of those turtles in particular that gets frequently posted to Discworld forums on the internet. And I never knew that it was a whole species that does that as a behavior. I just thought it was like this one turtle that had got stuff on its back. Just a so road that's guy really cool. doing a thing. <laughs> yeah. Just doing his own thing. Uh, that's really awesome. They also, along the way, and I'll, I'll mention this just because it's another tie into other of Pratchett's books, but they stop for a break and meet an elf, which is not an elf, but like a weird insect person. It plays this sort of entrancing music and Kin is almost like sort of entranced by it and then it leaves. And it's just sort of a moment, but it's very much that equating elves and insects that Pratchett does in the Discworld and then also has some other ideas about elves in later books. The next adventure they have is much worse. <laughs> this is where they are getting into what would be on Earth Germany and is in this world also a version of Germany and decide to stop so Silver and Kin can um, bathe. Kin is having a nice skinny dip in a stream when a bunch of German mercenaries find her and uh, take her captive. But they, they also, they weirded out by her. They think she's maybe like a river spirit of some sort because, you know, she's just out in the woods in the nude by herself. And presumably, you know, she doesn't look like they do. So they're a bit like, got no hair, you're a black woman. We're all from a world that doesn't have Africa. So we're like very confused. <laughs> That was interesting. I don't. I, the implications of that are again. I think this is a don't think too hard about that moment. Like they think she's supernatural for reasons. Let's not read too much into that. But also, you know, there's some Christers with them, and this is where they find out a bit more about the religion around Christos. But the important part is Kin is captured and imprisoned, and she's going to be executed for being a monster because. In the meantime, their ship, the remains of it that were inside the bubble of the disc world, has sort of done a bit of an orbit and crashed somewhere in the middle of Europe. And there's a huge plume of smoke because it's caused a huge amount of damage. A lot of the locals think this is a sign of the end of days. Christ is coming back. Armageddon is happening. And so they're all a bit on edge and freaking out. And uh, the other two have to rescue Kin, which they eventually do after a long sequence of like talking to her over their like hidden microphone system, learning a bit more about the world that they're in. And when they do come to free her, she's also been captured next to an actual demon who they can't figure out quite how he works, but he can read minds. He can talk to them. He speaks in uh, small caps, <laughs> like a, a couple of other characters in this book. And as one very important character in the disc world, we'll later do. Uh, his name is Fandor, and he he just behaves like a demon, but he kind of can read her thoughts and understand her language, but he doesn't really understand what any of the concepts mean. He doesn't really know what a spaceship is, but he can read the words that she uses to describe it. So they free him as well and continue on. And I'm really, I'm condensing a lot of plot here, but the dumbwaiter has also been damaged by the Germans, and so they stop off to repair it and try and figure out what the demon's deal is and realize that he is not literally there. He, the reason he can fly, even though he shouldn't be able to, according to the size of his wings and his body mass, is that he is constantly being matter transmitted from somewhere else, like a hundred times a second, hmm. so that he seems to be wherever he is, but he's being constantly put where he's supposed to be. But it's kind of gone a bit wrong. And so he's a bit fuzzy around the edges, which I thought was really interesting. And Silver also sort of says, the whole disc itself is like a sort of very nasty toy. Like, cause they're, as it goes on, that they get more and more angry about the fact that these humans have to live on this world that is crazy with all these dangers in it. 
but they think this technology is worth having, this teleportation technology, because humans have never been able to get it to work. They're angry because it has dangers on it, but also because it is breaking down. Like yes. the Germans think it's end of days because the ship has crashed, but also everyone is feeling a bit apocalyptic because, yeah, the stars haven't been behaving right, the planets haven't been behaving right. There's been really weird and nasty weather going on, mm. giant tides, and yeah, the can't relate as as the people who know what's actually going on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, God. yeah, but yeah, as the people who know that this world is, you know, artificial. Kin and, and her companions are going, yeah, this, this thing has been running for so long, it's mm. running down. The technology is breaking down. Yeah, it's bad. You know, once they've realized this, though, they also ask Svandor the demon about the middle of the disc, and he just basically says, oh, we're not allowed to go there. Anyone who goes there, like, he kind of gives all these legends about how awful it is. Like, it's kind of sounds a bit like the City of Brass from versions of hell. Like, it's like a black sand, and you can't enter it, and bad things happen to you if you go there. And so they decide he can't really help them. They let him go. And uh, they finish fixing the dumbwaiter. They keep traveling and they get to the crash site and they realize that the spaceship has crashed onto something which has exploded, like one of the key bits of the disc mechanism. And it has, in fact, blown a hole all the way through the disc so you can see to the bottom. But all the air hasn't escaped because there's still an intact force field around the whole thing. But as they sort of investigate it, they get a bit freaked out. This is a, another excuse for them to talk about The other weird part of human history in this book, which is that humans are a little bit like the Spindle Kings. So the Spindle Kings are described as being so psychic that not more than a thousand of them could live on a whole planet because the static from the other minds would drive them crazy. And this is an idea that comes back in the Long Earth books as well, where if there's too many people on a world, some people are sensitive to that and they can't handle it. They also talk about mind quakes, where once human population got way too big, millions of people just suddenly died. And it's implied, they don't really say exactly what happened, that it's kind of a version of that spindle mind static, that there were just too many people and the psychic feedback killed a bunch of them. And this is another reason why humans feel like they have to spread out onto other worlds and populate them with small groups of people at a time so that they can spread out a bit more thinly. Uh, which, I mean, in some ways seems like a gross justification of uh, colonization, but I mean, it's also a cool yeah. science fiction concept. So it, I don't think it's meant to be that. It was a very weird, like, I, I guess, again, this is a changing times thing. As someone reading it in the middle of essentially a literal apocalypse, reading about this very weird kind of apocalypse, mm. yeah, kind of almost magical apocalypse that's never fully explained was just, it was it was weird feels. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It just kind of felt like maybe one concept too many, I think, for me. Like the mind quakes thing, I was like, did we need that as a justification? I feel like they could have just done it without we're all dying because of this. It was like I I love when there's lots of ideas packed into something, but I feel like because some of them didn't go anywhere or it was like thrown in to something, I just felt like maybe it was one concept too many. And it's not like humans don't have the urge to spread anyway. Exactly. Yeah. We didn't really need that. Yeah, it was interesting. There's an amazing vision much earlier in the book of like one of Kin's only memories of Earth from her childhood where it's like hugely depopulated and they've actually got robots kind of trying to hold on to their culture for them so that they Mm. can re-inherit it when they repopulate. And like, I mean, that was glorious, although I definitely want to talk about problematic robots later on. (laughs) Um, That was a glorious image. But then, yeah, as you say, the actual justification behind it felt just a bit weirdly tacked on Mm. yeah yeah and i think because they already had the spindle king's idea of it in there i don't know that it needed to be applied to humanity and but i think also maybe you know if if there had been another edit or another pass of this book maybe that would have been tied more clearly into the revelation at the end of the book but as it is it Mm. it wasn't so i feel like it was it was a little bit yeah i agree with you I, i think that was one of the ideas that i'm like that's interesting but maybe that's one one idea too far i agree it is fascinating to me. So I, I read the first Long Earth book and I it didn't grab me, so I didn't keep going with them. I didn't know that that gets in a way revisited in the Long Earth books, but that fascinates me because it does suggest that it was something on Terry Pratchett's mind. Mm. Um, yeah. Something that he wanted to explore. Yeah. And the original short story that inspired those novels was written only a few years after this. Supposedly, it's a little bit unclear exactly when he wrote it. There's some differing accounts of that, but it seems like maybe he wrote it in between this and writing the first Discworld book, or at least in between the first Discworld book being written and then being successful. So it's, or, or in between a couple of later books. Anyway, it was it was not long after this. So yes, yeah, definitely an idea from around this time that he then wanted to revisit. Uh, although it doesn't come up that much in the short story, to be fair. 
Look, the other thing that happens when they're investigating this hole through the disc is that a sort of safety mechanism is triggered, which is a huge hologram of a three-headed demon, which um, reminds Kin of like her world's equivalent of Mount Rushmore, which has the presidents of Valhalla on it, (laughs) which implies that, in fact, Valhalla is not just Vikings and North American, Native American tribes, but also like South American indigenous people as well. Cause one of the names seems like it comes more from South America of one of the presidents. So I'm like, wow, that no wonder they're a global power. There's like a huge number of people there. There's a huge variety of cultures all kind of coming together. So yeah, I thought that was cool. But anyway, the hologram appears. It's supposed to scare people off from this danger. And when they kind of ignore it and go, yeah, whatever, it summons a lightning bolt, which totally destroys the dumbwaiter. And there's been a couple of times in the story up till now where it's been damaged, but they've always been able to fix it. But this is like, it's melted into like droplets, like there's no way to get it back. And this ratchets up the tension because now they're on a, a real time limit. Silver is going to go feral in the next 50 hours or so. They've got to reach the center as quickly as possible. Not only that, but they, they don't even know that the center is going to get them off the planet. Yeah. Like there is the yeah. very real possibility that they're just stranded there. So yeah, it is hugely tense. Yeah. And they do talk about that. I I think all the way through when they're talking about their strategy, I feel like the dialogue, like I, I don't know if this has come across, but I love this book so much. Like I, I really, I really got into it and I really liked the way the characters talk to each other and discuss their options and their plans. And, and they were always making rational choices in a situation where there's no best choice. Like it felt really great. I really loved it. And also that they were always working together, even when they had differences and when there's a lot of conversations about how particularly humans just see these aliens as, as other humans who are a bit weird and they can't really understand each other because they're fundamentally different, but they still work together. They still have this friendship and they still care about each other, even when, you know, Marco's being practical and he's like, well, look, I've got to have a sword because what if Silver doesn't make it? You know, and Silver's being practical and she's like, look, I want you, if, if it happens, you know, I want you to stun me and let Marco, you know, put me down because like, I don't want to eat you, <laughs> you know, like, and it's, it feels like I, I was fully bought into it at the time. Mm, God, I really felt for Silver. Like, yeah. Yeah. It was very well done. And I was worried that it was going to happen as well. Like the whole time, like, it's just very stressful. Yeah. And it, and it does kind of happen, but they. Does, like all the way through, like with the. It gets very close. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. It's a constant threat that feels very real. And I thought that was such a great level of tension to bring to the book. But now as the tension is ratcheted up to maximum and they're heading across, they reach what would be, you know, the Middle East in our Earth and they see what they think is an aircraft, but it turns out to be a flying carpet because there's a guy here who is kind of like, he's like a character out of the Arabian Nights or something, but he's collected a whole bunch of magical artifacts from across the disc. And they kind of discuss the fact that, well, look, if you've had the, all these weird, essentially magic items that are made possible through high technology, but you don't know that, you just know they're magic items and they just work. Of course you would hoard them. Like if you could get your hands on them, like it would make you incredibly powerful. And this guy's got this big collection of them and he wants their flying belts because he hasn't got anything quite like that, but he does have a flying carpet. And so he sort of, you know, wants to negotiate with them in inverted commas. And he's got a genie in a bottle, like a gin, basically. They refer to it mostly as a demon, but it's clear it's, you know, a genie and a lamp who can do all kinds of stuff for them. And this is where, you know, he summons the food that they want including the Kung Fu bar <laughs> meal that Marco wants. Mm. But he can't do shand proteins because he doesn't really understand what they are, which is a bit weird. I'm not quite sure. I when he recreates like a meal from their memory and it's like entirely with the packaging and the labeling on it from Earth, I was like, okay, so why can you do that but not the shand proteins? See, that fully worked for me, I have to say. That's something I actually really liked as a detail because for me it felt like one of those moments where you're like, look, this essentially looks and feels in every way like magic, but it's not. It has limitations because it's technology. Mm. So my reading on it was, you know, shand proteins are not something that the specific atoms and molecules available on Earth can produce, not Mm. on Earth, but on this flat Earth. That's a hard limitation on the technology. Um, that makes yeah, sense. So I, I really like that detail. Also, of course, it gives you a nice chance of having a brief moment of hope and then having that taken <laughs> away from you. Yes. I mean, it's also taken away from the fact that this guy doesn't just want to add the flying belts to his collection. He wants to put Marco and Silver in his zoo of magical creatures. And so he drugs Kin and imprisons her as well. But she manages to escape 
and get into the store of magical items where she finds a very fancy magical sword and also a magical flying mechanical horse, which is just some cool shit. Like, what a great excuse to just go, hey, in the middle of my sci-fi story, here's some of the coolest stuff from Earth folklore. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so she manages to escape and they capture the the genie and get him to fly them on the magic carpet to the center of the disc with the promise that they're going to let him go. And they also say, you know, if I threw your lamp over the edge into the ocean, what would happen? And there's a great line where he says, well, you know, it would sit on the bottom of the sea and occasionally a crab or a fish would rub up against it. But their wishes are very simple and easy to grant. <laughs> I was like, that's a lovely, mm-hmm. that's a lovely line. I loved both the genie and the demon in the, it's made very clear very early on that they are just the products of technology. So any intelligence they have is itself artificial, but they don't know that or they don't believe that. Like they see themselves as actual genuine magical beings and that's fully logically consistent for them. And yeah, I, I just thought that was very lovely. Yeah, there's that great bit where um, Svandor, the demon, introduces himself. He says, I am Svandor. I spread arthritis, the bone ache, and the ague of the neck. I blight crops and cause abortion in cattle. They say I foul streams and hurl the lightning stone. And do you do all that? I suppose so. I certainly always intend to. (laughs) I love it. it. He doesn't really know. but thats He's trying to do it. He's just fulfilling that role. Yeah, and Mm. the the genie's the same. They were really lovely little characters who sort of show up and do their bit for the plot and then disappear, but they're a lot of fun while they're there. I love them. Uh, But they do make it to the middle of the disc, although not before Silver succumbs to the hunger and starts attacking Marco, and Marco's on the flying carpet with her, and uh, they're starting to fight, but they go ahead as fast as they can go, and as they get close enough to the edge of the circular thing in the middle of the disc, they just disappear. Kin's like, what? And then she gets close enough and she disappears and wakes up in what is clearly part of the control rooms of the disc because it's this much more high-tech metal room. There's all these weird red lights pointing at her that she doesn't like. And she asks to get out of there and she disappears and appears somewhere else. And because they don't have teleportation technology, they are kind of a bit, I think rightly too, suspicious of it and a bit scared of it. And also it's like everything else on the disc, it's starting to go a bit wrong. So they use it a couple of times. And then when there's a possibility to use it to get Marco and Silva out of the holding cell they're in, which has no doors, Kin doesn't teleport them out when she's got control of the systems because she's like, there's a 40% chance you will like not ever appear again. (laughs) Uh, I thought that was nice that she was like, I'm not taking that risk. So instead she teleports like in a weapon and lets Marco blast his way out in true Kung fashion. (laughs) But I'm skipping ahead a little bit there because what happens is she wanders around a bit and starts breaking stuff to hopefully get the attention of whoever's here. There's a great sequence where a little repair robot comes and so she breaks the little repair robot so a bigger repair bot comes and like there's a sort of escalation and eventually like a tank kind of robot turns up with Marco riding it and they're reunited, which was very nice. And they together, you know, maraud through the place until eventually they're attacked by the Grim Reaper, who's trying to stop them from breaking stuff because Marco just sort of goes a bit super paranoid and starts destroying things. And when Kin smashes the Grim Reaper, that's when they imprison Marco and Silva and they transport her to the actual central computer room. And she meets the committee, which is a computer intelligence made up of various minds, we assume, because it calls itself a committee. And there's a chair with a dead person in it. (laughs) and a sort of neuro connector helmet above it. And the committee talks to her and is like, look, this is what's been going on. This guy came from outside of the disc in a spaceship and he wrecked the place and it was awful. Then he came here and he found us and we were like, great, you can be our new chairman because he killed the past one because we need an actual human being to contribute creativity and also to help us fix and maintain the disc. We can't do it by ourselves. And usually we kidnap someone from the disc and we use them. But we thought, oh, great, this guy's from outside and our systems are breaking down. And as Kin points out to them, you can't keep going without some outside help. Like you can cannibalize your own systems for repairs for a while, but eventually you're going to need new materials to make this place work. And also this place shouldn't work. It's awful. It's a fascinating concept that, again, hints at things that will become clear later, that the computers themselves can do basically anything to make this place run. They can do whatever needs doing, but they need a human guiding them. 
Yeah. And like that human can be someone from this world who has absolutely no idea about the technology, absolutely no idea how to make any of it work, but they still need a human plugged into them. Like they can do the work, but a human has to provide something and it's not fully clear what that something is yet. Yeah. I feel. Yeah, exactly. But she immediately like goes, well, I'm going to make a few changes around here. And she's like, no more demons, no more earthquakes. And also she talks to Marco and Silva and is like, Marco, you've got to cut a bit out of Silva. And they use that as a sample in order to make her some shand meat that she can eat. So she's going to be okay. And then she wants them to come to her at the main control room, but they have to walk because she doesn't want to use the teleporter. And it takes them days because this control complex is so big. While they're on the way, she finds out the secret basically of the whole place. She agrees that, okay, look, I'll promise to fix the disc as best we can and also to build another world that is like this, but a proper planet that we can put all the people here on because we've got to look after them. Yeah, and this place is not going to survive, basically. Yeah. this You know, we can't keep patching it. And the committee understands this and they're like, yes, that's what we want. And she says, okay, I'll do it. And they're like, great, then we'll tell you what you want to know, which is who built it. And she's like, you're just going to believe me? And they're like, yeah, we've been watching you because the other guy was so awful that when you first arrived, we're like, we're not going to do anything except watch you. That's why there was a raven following you. That was our raven which refers to itself as the eyes of God because there's a sequence we didn't talk about where they catch it and it escapes because it's a robot with hugely powerful (laughs) rocket motors on it. And it says, you'll be sorry, you messed with the eyes of God. Um, And they're a bit worried about Marco in particular because he's so violent, but they decide that there's a like 99.87% chance that Kin will keep her promise. So they're like, yeah, no, we're going to do it. And so she plugs into the helmet and basically what it does is awaken her to her true self because she, like all the other intelligent creatures in the universe, and my read on this, and maybe yours is different, is that it's not just humans, it's also Kungs and huh. Shans, uh, are actually the remnants of the builders, not just of the disc, not just of the other worlds, of the entire universe. And that the disc and the Spindle Kings and all the other precursor races didn't really exist. They are all the equivalent of the plesiosaur in the strata. And the universe itself was created by these builders only 70,000 years ago. Everything that suggests it's older is all fake. Mm. And then what they did was they went to sleep and became the kind of the soul, the interior motivating spirit of all of the intelligent life in the universe, but otherwise kind of went to sleep. And what the committee is able to do is to wake that part up and bring it back to consciousness. And when Kin does this, she's like, oh, yeah, that's who I am. And then she goes, oh, I'm going to go back to sleep. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to tweak Kin's memory so that when I become Kin again, I remember this information, but I'm still just Kin. And that's the kind of bargain she strikes with them, that she has this knowledge now. And she's like, I'm going to write a new version of my book that tells the actual truth, which is so weird. And then they they leave. They don't just leave, of course. There's a whole thing where like they've got a rock like a giant bird from mythology that's going to pick up this capsule that they build and hurl them out into space so they can use the matrix drive they've constructed to go home and then come back with materials and start building a new planet. And Kin's like, I'll start a new company if the company won't do this because with the technology you've given me, I can do that. I'll have more money than God. It'll be amazing. And they kind of on their way home, which is where the book ends as they leave and get through the hole out into space. They're kind of discussing, is that really what this means? Like, we are the builders, like the bit inside us that drives us, like that was the builders and it's there all along. And Kin's like, well, they didn't really say that, but that's what I think. (laughs) And that's kind of the end. I like your interpretation that it's all the sentient races of the universe that have these souls within them. I have to admit, I did read it as very human centric. I read that as Mm. like, yeah, you know, this is. This is the thing that makes humanity special. It's our creative spark within us. But I like your version. I, I, what? Yeah, I read it that way because Silver says something like, they're us, aren't they? And she includes herself. Mm. And Kin's like, yeah, I think that's right. So that was what made me think, oh, it's everyone. You know, like humans, yeah. they're all different. It's, I mean, it's very similar to The Dark Side of the Sun, his other early novel where, and this is a spoiler if you haven't read it, I apologize, but, you know, there's a race of precursor aliens who also turn themselves into something much more mundane for other reasons. But here I think the echo is it's like the humans spreading themselves out in all these different worlds in order to survive. The builders, as they get called in the end, have done something similar. They've kind of gone, well, we made the universe and now we're like kind of bored. Um, Let's turn ourselves into something else (laughs) and spread out and see what happens. I love the parallel between that and the mice in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah. (laughs) That was clearly on everyone's mind at just this moment in time. Yeah, yeah. 
but yeah, no, I like that. I think I assumed it was just humans because of the committee kind of wanting to have a human in the chair. But mm. I mean, they have very good reason not to trust Marco. And as you point out, Silver at that point is out of action. Mm. It does make sense that they would need Kin. Yeah, and they've been observing her and they feel like they can trust her because she's reacted poor. Like she's basically gone, this is awful. Look at the way these people have to live. And like they're going to develop a science here, but it's the wrong science. It won't help them understand the actual universe if they were ever to get out there. It'll only work here. Mm. So, yeah, I think they, yeah, trust her. Are there any other quotes or favourite bits that we want to talk about? Before the podcast, we were talking about reading the recap on Wikipedia and it putting a thing in there that I did not pick up. Mm. And there's a suggestion on the Wikipedia article that they're making our world and so this is all the past, like the new one oh, that they yeah. moved us, on it, which is why like earlier I was like, is it the future or is it the past? I hadn't really thought about that at all because – I think as we're supposed to, I thought that our world was the one that Kin is from and then she's far forward from us. But yeah, I, if that's the case, I really like it. I did not pick that up in the text, but I also fully accept that that could be me in the way that I read it. No, I was exactly the same. I didn't pick it up. And then when I read the Wikipedia synopsis, it was sort of a, oh, moment of like, that explains why it's so much of an alternate history that Kin comes from. Mm. So yeah. it's a... It, yeah, I do feel like that might have been what the book was going for, but I definitely didn't manage to pick it up. Mm. I mean, the more I think about it, I have some concerns around the idea that, like, this Earth's history comes from an Earth in which Native Americans didn't exist, Aboriginal people didn't exist. <laughs> Africa African didn't exist, apparently. Didn't exist. <laughs> yeah. They were all created later for the refugee planet. Like, ooh. Yeah. And I know that's not what he was going for, but it is, like – Thinking about it from that context of as this this as a precursor to our Earth does make you go, ah, oh, well, yeah, making it just a hemisphere of the Earth allowed it to be very European-centric. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think you can read it that way, as in the Earth she makes to transplant the humans onto then becomes our world. That's definitely one potential. And I think that is a perfectly fine interpretation. I don't know that that's definitively what he meant to write. So I think this is a case of someone on Wikipedia putting their personal interpretation into text, which is something I, I watched a YouTube video about recently. Yeah. yeah. Will you be going in and fixing that? <laughs> Edit <Sure. pause. laughs> I will go and find a quote because I did find some stuff that Pratchett said about the book at the time. And there's other times when he's talked about it. And I don't think he ever explicitly said that that was the intention of the end of the book. I mean, it's a pretty direct conclusion to draw if you think about it that way. It does yeah. make sense of some stuff that to me didn't make a lot of sense reading it. Th things like the the Christos cult where I'm like, so what? what is that? Mm. You know, why are these familiar things developing on this fake earth as opposed to the real earth? It does make sense. Like it is definitely an interpretation that would explain that stuff. But yes, whether or not that's what he was trying to hint at is certainly open to... Yeah. Well, I mean, I I kind of just felt like that that was to flip our expectations. Like you would normally have people from our Earth visiting an alternate Earth that's weird. And in, in this, this is part of the flipping of that expectation is that they visit an Earth that is weird, but it's still familiar to us because it's like what people thought the Earth was like a thousand years ago. But the people who are investigating it are the ones who are from a different history that went very differently. And then it turns out like even the whole universe was built 70,000 years ago. And I guess the other thing that does support the Wikipedia contention is that bit at the start, which is about the Natural History Museum, where there's weird stuff in the strata and, like, you know, the Neanderthal with the gold tooth and the Tyrannosaurus with the wristwatch. Like, that implies that our modern world or the version of our modern world that results, because I don't, it wouldn't be Earth, not our Earth. It's a version of Earth, but it's had some cowboys put weird stuff in the strata of that <laughs> planet, just like at the start of the book. So. I didn't draw that direct conclusion, but, you know, they clearly make a version of Earth. I don't think it's really supposed to be our Earth, although it's a lot closer than Kin's Earth. I mean, ours could come several iterations later if they keep doing this over and yeah. over again. Mm. Well, I mean, also, you know, by the time they build the other Earth, it's going to be a, a century later. And there's, you know, like a lot of things have going to be different in history. So the history of the Discworld humans is going to diverge from our history as well as from Kin's history. So I feel like, you know, it's going to be its own thing. And I don't think it's meant to be our Earth. It's just meant to feel a lot more familiar to us while they're on it. That's, that was my read of it. But they're never going to get the awesome Norse Native Americans. Yeah. yeah. It's a cool concept. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. I did want to briefly, and I mean, I feel, I feel like I keep being like, but here's the thing I didn't like. And I mean, I, you know, right. I, there was lots of fantastic stuff in this book, which we've already talked about. But I do, another thing like the mind quakes that I kind of wish they just left out was <sighs> very complicated feelings about robots, which is mm. such a minor part of the book. And I'm not talking about the robots that we meet at the end that are at the hub of the No, I know which robots you're Earth, talking which about. are clearly the builder robots, but you know, we do get a couple of references early on that make it clear that Kin's version of humanity has robots. That's a part of their society. And there's a couple of really fascinating references to this idea of robots maintaining cultural traditions that humanity was maybe losing mm. uh, because there weren't enough of them. I loved that stuff. Except then also, at some point in their robots have just become kind of their slaves, to the point where the one robot that we have any decent interactions with randomly uses black American yeah. slave talk. Yeah. Which is even weirder, given the implication that there never was a black America in Kin's version of Earth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally different history. But yeah, that was just a moment that I wish they had left out. He does that in Dark Side of the Sun as well. There's a One of the main characters is a robot who, when he's first sort of acquired by the main character, talks in that kind of stereotypical slave talk and then gets told to knock it off in a very similar fashion to what happens in this book, although it takes a bit longer. And it's similarly like, no, <laughs> I didn't like that just, at all. Just cringe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, I knew, I knew exactly where you were going. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the rest of it is quite interesting. Like, there's even the bit with Silver talks about watching an Earth film where all the actors are robots, except there's a robot character, and they couldn't find any robots who could act like a robot, so they had to hire a human Ooh. to play the robot in the film. <laughs> And, Which is fabulous. And then at the end of describing this to Marco, it goes, oh, we've been around humans too long. <laughs> this makes sense to me. Why am I talking to you about this? Yep. It was very funny. And like Kin's, Kin's one childhood memory of Earth is literally of robots dancing the Morris because it wouldn't be a Terry <laughs> Pratchett book if he hadn't found a way to fit Morris dancing in there. Mm -hmm. Like It's amazing. Yeah, love that stuff. And she whistles uh, Mrs. Widry's Lodger as the tune, which comes back in the Discworld books. There's so many bits. Like, we could list them all. That would take us forever. But there's lots. There's lots of little references in here. All right. Well, look, let's get into some questions then. The first question comes from Sven via Discord. Even if Terry always said that fantasy and sci-fi are the same, after reading his two pre-Discworld sci-fi books and The Long Earth, do you think Terry would have been a good sci-fi author? Funny fantasy is a broad genre, but sci-fi seems harder. Interesting one. Oh, yeah. Look, I, I really love this. I also really liked, and I know you were not as big a fan of it, Liz, when we discussed it, The Dark Side of the Sun. And I think he was writing really well the kind of sci-fi that was being written at the time. And as we've said in our Long Earth episodes, they sometimes do feel like a bit of a throwback to that kind of 70s and 80s sci-fi. And I think he's really good at that sort of stuff. But I think if he'd been writing that the whole time instead of writing the Discworld, he would have evolved and be writing much more modern and weirder sci-fi now. So I, I think he could have done it for sure. He certainly had a lot of interest in it. Yeah. I haven't read a lot of sci-fi of the times. I'm not that much of a golden age sci-fi reader, but certainly Terry Pratchett's sci-fi feels like someone who wants to write fantasy, but is writing sci-fi <laughs> to a certain extent. Like the fact that he is finding every possible excuse to throw in dragons and magic carpets and, you know, flying mechanical horses. It was very easy for me to headcanon it as a fantasy author desperately trying to get out. Yeah. And like, I've always found something to enjoy in all of his early books. There's always something in there that I like and I don't regret reading any of them, but I do think that it's very clear that he improves as an author, like as he comes into his own voice more along his whole journey of writing. And I think if he'd chosen sci-fi, would have seen that same path. So if he'd wanted to do sci-fi, he could have been an excellent sci-fi writer. But I agree with you, EJ, that it seems like his soul wanted to do fantasy, so it was never going to be sci-fi. And like, and I mean, this is drawing extremely broad bows here, but I feel like the way that his writing matured into kind of exploring very real, very human things through allegory is something that fantasy lends itself better to in a way. Like, I feel like you could do some amazing explorations in science fiction, but they tend to be more literal. Mm, they're more connected to our real world. Mm. Exactly. Even, even when they're a mirror of it. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like the way that he writes best fits very well in fantasy. And I'd be certainly interesting to have seen how it fit into science fiction as a genre. But well, yeah, I feel like the attitude of his books, even the fantasy books, 
feels more like science fiction to me than a lot of fantasy because he's always like doing that thing where he's putting up a lens to human society and human issues. But the tropes that he enjoys are more those fantasy ones. So I feel like there's mm. there's an interesting blend there. And could that have gone the other way? Don't know. All right. So this question comes from Bell via Discord. How does Strata compare to other sci-fi written around the same time? I am the worst possible person to answer that because I've read very little of it. As research for this podcast, I did go and read the entire synopsis of Ringworld on Wikipedia, which is how I know Strata does follow that pattern quite closely. Hmm. And my main observation there, I felt like both Strata and Ringworld as described and like the early Discworld books like Color of Magic, rather than being like character driven or even plot driven, I described them as like exploration driven. Mm, yeah. Like the main thematic constant was let's keep going and seeing new parts of this interesting world that the author is introducing us to. So I don't know if that's a 80s common thing. Well, it's very, I mean, it's from the tradition of the kind of fantasy that this world is particularly is parodying, but it's also in some of the science fiction of the time too, that it was about exploring ideas and, and worlds as much as anything else. And so, yeah, the early Discworld books are all this kind of great epic traipsing across the disc, seeing lots of different places. Like the first five books or so are, are mostly like that. Like even something like Mort, which has a, you know, it's character driven, there's a plot but it goes to so many different places. He visits so many different parts of the disc in order to learn how to do the job. And that was a big part of it. And I think that was, that was a big part of sci-fi at the time. Like it was, you know, it was before films could really show you amazing other worlds. Like you got to remember this was 1981. So Star Wars is only like four years old. And so these novels are like the way that you explore these rich, weird other landscapes. It's a little bit past a lot of the most famous books like the Ringworld itself, the first Ringworld book is like from 1970. The recent one was the first sequel, which was a couple of years before this, which is probably why it was in people's minds again. But stuff like Dune was before this and Hitchhikers was just before. But a lot of the big books that were winning awards and stuff at the time this was written are not ones that have stood the test of time. <laughs> you know, They're not ones, unless you're really into that sort of era of sci-fi, they're not things that immediately leap to mind. Yeah, I've given a few of the Golden Age authors a go, and I fully am aware that this is as much about times changing and people changing and all of that, but I just I can't deal with it. I find it just so mm. dated in so many ways, in the ways that the characters are drawn, particularly the ways that female characters are drawn, Yes, um, and in some of the sort of concepts, and I just, yeah, could stick with it. For me, I actually, I think that Strata compares very favorably to a lot of those books because the thing oh. that I, and I've said this on the podcast before, the thing that really dates them is not the technology. It's not their vision of like other worlds. It's the social stuff, you know, like when you watch an episode of Star Trek and they behave like kinds of sexuality, for example, are really weird. You're like, uh, <laughs> when is yep. this set again? Like it, yep. it just feels so weird. And it's those things that trip them up because they're not thinking about that. They're not thinking about what's the social evolution. And I think this book sidesteps a lot of that by making it about the difference between humans and aliens and set in a world which is itself is, is mired in this historical version of Earth. So I thought that was an interesting thing. But although having said that, like a lot of Dark Side of the Sun also manages to avoid a lot of those problems. Not all of them. Well, and compared to the original Ringworld, this is quite progressive in that, as we said before, black woman protagonist. Yeah. Two out of the three main characters are female. Yeah. Shouldn't be impressive, but it is. This is also a thing that helps it not get dated. There's no romance in it. So there's no opportunity mm. to have a very old fashioned idea of how that works. Like in Ringworld, two of the main characters get together and then one of them ends up staying on the Ringworld because she gets together with someone who lives there. And you're like, Of course. Um, yeah. Is that what the book's about? Really? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's even any hints of anything like that in Strata. It's fantastic. Head, yeah. head canon, everyone asexual. Amazing. Yep. <laughs> Happy with that. Happy with that. Yep. Done. Uh, but although Lifelong Friends is also my hand canon. Like they all oh, heck yeah. Forever. Yeah, no, they are fully going to stay together after this, like friendship-wise. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, so that's our sort of very amateur <laughs> answer to your question, Bill. <laughs> We're professionals. This one from Des via Twitter. So a lot of ideas that became Discworld or proto-Discworld. What standalone books by other authors do you wish spawned a 41 book series? <laughs> Stardust for Neil Gaiman for me. Ooh. I mean, that's certainly a world you could explore. There's heaps going on there. There is yeah. heaps going on there. Yeah. I mean, I, 
I would say, like you said, like you could have written 41 books about the actual universe this book is set in without yeah. inventing the Discworld, you know? Yeah, there are so many other theories that could still be spawned from this book. Like, yeah. go to aspiring writers. That is a good question, though. The problem is I'm looking at my bookshelf for inspiration, but the bookshelf <laughs> I have in the office is the one that's just got Terry Pratchett books on it. So my bookshelf helpful. is downstairs and half of it's still in boxes from moving house. Totally useless. Oh, no. Well, I mean, if I think about, you know, what are some of my favorite standalone books? Um, and I mean, sometimes standalone books, I really enjoy that that's all you get. Yeah. I I, I take inspiration from you, Des. One of my favorite Neil Gaiman books is, is Neverwhere. And I kind of wish there were a lot more books in that world. I mean, again, like you were saying, EJ, I, I'm quite happy that that's all there is, although it's not all there is. There's a short story and there is a sequel coming. But I feel like you could have spun that off into a whole series. And I think where, because in my imagination where that would go is that you've got London below, but that can't be in that world. That can't be the only city that has spawned this sort of fantastic other version of itself based on the folklore and, and legends of the city itself. So you could explore other cities around the world and other cultures through the lens of that. Like, you know, what's what's the equivalent for Paris? What's the equivalent for Beijing? What's the equivalent for Calcutta? Like what, what's, you know, all those places, they would have their own version of what in London is London Below. And how do they connect to each other? Because they clearly do. Like some of the characters in London Below have come from somewhere else. Uh, like Hunter has been other places around the world hunting things and she clearly oh, hasn't just been doing that in the real normal world. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So I feel like that could, I, I mean, again, I'm very happy. I'm perfectly happy that it hasn't. And I'll be very excited about the sequel when it comes out. But, you know, I feel like that could have been a, a whole thing. Mm. I'm, I'm sure. really struggling with this because I feel like the books that I've read fall into the categories of either already a series, which is most of them, honestly, or yeah. like standalone books that just work so well as a self-contained thing. Yeah. My desperately trying to come up with a standalone book, the only one that I can come up with from recent reading is Light from Uncommon Stars, which is an amazing book I feel like would honestly suffer for trying to turn into a series because it has so many wild concepts drawn into it. Right. I mean, it's it's sort of like we were saying about Strata. It's amazing, but don't overthink it. And I feel like to build on it, you would have to then overthink it. Light from Uncommon Stars is this amazing mashup of science fiction, fantasy, and horror tropes in the same book. Like, oh, wow. Literally, the, the two main characters are a refugee starship captain and a woman who sold her soul to the devil for the wow. ability to be an amazing violinist. And they just <laughs> exist in the same book. Yeah. And that's absolutely fine. Yeah. It's, that's, that's cool. There were books that I read as a kid that I think had a lot of cool ideas in them. I don't know if I'd want 41 more <laughs> of those books. But that's hard to say. I mean, how many series run for 41 books? None is the answer. None, none at all. Certainly not ones written by the same author. Yep, yep. Yeah. Actually, this is not a book. I mean, it is a book, but I'm actually talking about the film version specifically. I've just seen the film Nimona, which oh, yes. I will rave about for far too long if you let me. It's very good. And I know that that is based on, although I haven't read it yet, a standalone graphic novel. Originally a webcomic. Yes, also that. Tragically no longer on the web, or I would have devoured it by now. But the graphic novel I know is standalone. I don't know if this also applies to that, but I would love to see more in the world of the movie because mm. uh, without spoilering for people who haven't seen it yet, but where the movie ends, not just the main characters, but the world itself is suddenly ripe for expansion. Yes, that's true. And I would love to see where that goes. Oh, yeah. That's actually that's a really good answer, actually. Let's move on. Yep. All right. This one comes from Ryan Walker via Facebook. Curious if you've ever listened to the audiobook versions of these stories. A great way to fall asleep at night for me. So I these days actually do audiobooks for preference, Mm -hmm. which I know is a controversial choice, but it really shouldn't be. So I'm neurodivergent and I actually struggle quite a bit with the written word. And I love audiobooks because I have gone from barely getting through a few books a year back to where I was as a child, which is just devouring them. Mm -hmm. So when you asked me to come on and do Strata, you, you set me a real challenge because Strata is one of the Terry Pratchett books that doesn't have an audio version. Well, there is one. It might not be widely available, but there definitely is one. I only found one, true story, in German. Oh, wow. Well, there is a Stephen Briggs one. Uh, So Stephen Briggs, who's read a lot of the Discworld books, particularly the unabridged later versions, he has read both Dark Side. Well, he's definitely done Strata. I think he's done Dark Side of the Sun as well, but they might not still be in print is the problem because they probably weren't that. (laughs) Yeah, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, but yes, I have been because reading Strata gave me a taste for something like getting back into a bunch of Pratchett. It's been a while. So I've been very much enjoying the Tony Robinson readings. Oh, yeah. Uh, because he does, I don't know if he does all of them, but he does all of the Tiffany aching ones. Yes. I, know, I don't point this out for any reason except that we had someone listen to one of them and not realize they are abridged. So they're not the full <gasps> books, the what? Tony Robinson ones. Yeah. What? All the Tony Robinson ones are abridged versions of the novel. <sighs> Oh, I feel so betrayed now. So if you want the full ones, the new Penguin ones are unabridged. I will seek them out. I don't think it's controversial. I think it is true to say it is a different experience to reading a book in print, but it's not a lesser experience. It's just a different experience. Um, Yeah, And you absolutely have experienced the book, even if you've done it differently. Yeah. And I mean, it it can lead to some fascinating differences to compare. So um, one of my currently absolutely hooked on series is the um lock tomb series oh yeah uh, Harrow, oh, I love Gideon them. the ninth and so on listening to them on audiobook is fascinating because the second book is mostly in the second person yes. and when you're reading it that is a lot more ambiguous than when you're hearing it narrated because of course the narrator had to choose a voice to do it in yeah I, mean, I guess she didn't have to choose that but she did she chose to do it in the voice of the person who is the person speaking well which- is not that's, revealed in the book. It's hinted at, but it's not yeah. revealed in the book for quite a while. Yeah, that's true. Oh. There's also at least one, because Tamsin Muir is another person who loves a good pun, there's also at least one word-based gag in the third book that I got immediately hearing it spoken that I know a lot of people read it didn't get until I was like, ah, <laughs> uh, ah. Uh. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah puns, are, puns are like that. And some, and, you know, and the reverse is true. Some jokes work better in print than they do uh, mm, yeah. said out loud. So Absolutely. it's, it's a, yeah, it's a different experience, but that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. All right. This one comes from Ian Malcolm via Mastodon. Despite being a lifelong Pratchett fan, I'd never actually read Strata. So I guess my slightly facetious question is, why the hell haven't I read it yet? And my <laughs> actual question is, should I finally read it? And if so, why? Why, why hasn't Ian read Strata? <laughs> we can't answer that question for you, Ian. What, is, what a that weird one. thing to say. I mean, maybe because it's harder to find in a library than a more recent project. That's true. But this is me projecting your life for you, Ian. I, <laughs> I I don't know what your life looks like. I don't know if it's still in print. I don't know if Strata and Dark Side of the Sun are still in print. I don't think there's a new edition of them. I think they're still the Corgi ones from the 90s. Um, yeah. whereas the Discworld books have all had new editions, the trucker books have, you know, a, a lot of his other stuff has all had new editions since then. So they yeah. might not still be in print. So that might be part of the reason. Should you finally read it? I look, my answer is yes. I think it's a great book. I think it's fun to see where the ideas of the Discworld came from, but also that it's a great book in its own right. And it is doing something very different to what the Discworld does, even if the central idea of there being a planet that's actually flat is in there and so are a lot of little jokes and references because there's so many. But we'll, we'll talk about those in a moment, I think. Do you, what do well, you think about that? I'm going to be the David to your Margaret, um, <laughs> which is a very <laughs> Australian reference there. <laughs> yes. But, yeah, my feeling is if you are an absolute hardcore Terry Pratchett fan who wants to be completionist, then yes, it is a, a really interesting insight into stuff that was on his mind before the Discworld series. And yeah, it's an interesting take. If you are less of a hardcore Pratchett fan, you know, I am someone who Terry Pratchett was a huge part of my growing up and I am still deeply in love with his later works, but I do find as a modern reader, his older stuff sometimes just quite painful to get through. Sorry, Terry. And to me, Strata falls into that. It just, it doesn't have that magic for me. Not yet. Okay. It's got hints of it, but yeah. Yeah. I think for me, I still really enjoy the early stuff. I recognize it's not the same, but I enjoy it possibly from a slightly nostalgic lens because it does remind me of some of the stuff that I read when I was very young and getting into sci-fi and fantasy. Yep. But I genuinely do think it's very good. I don't necessarily think it's better than than what he would write (laughs) later, and I certainly think he got better as a writer, but I actually am constantly surprised when we go back and read his really early stuff how good it is. Okay. So, yeah, I really enjoy it. I think it's worth reading, but I don't think your think, viewpoint yeah. is invalid. I think that's very good. <laughs> very, kind that's of very reasonable balance view for you there, Ian. Yeah, personally, I think that, that, yeah, the things about Terry Pratchett that appeal to you the most are the things that it took him the longest really to settle into and yeah. to, to, to get good at because they're hard things to do, you know. Huge mm. respect for his craft as a writer. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, and I ended up in a conversation with a workmate yesterday because I was coming on this podcast about Terry Pratchett books. And she in particular, as a fantasy sci-fi fan, had tried to get into Discworld starting with Color of Magic and just was just said, you know, it just wasn't for me. And I said, try some of the later ones. I think it very much is a case where the earlier ones won't do it for everybody. Yeah, it's a different kind of book. Not to say that any book does it for everybody, but yeah. Yeah, and I mean, and Pratchett himself referenced that. Like he said, this is the author, folks, telling you don't start with The Colour of Magic, which I think is harsh Like, because, again, I think it is a good book, but I mm. absolutely also don't think it's the same kind of book and it's certainly mm. not written the same way as even, you know, books five or six books later in the series. Yeah. Um, it's much more similar to this in, in yeah. a lot of ways. Yeah. Exactly, which makes sense timeline-wise. <laughs> Yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> it's almost like he evolved as a writer. Um, yeah. This one comes from Dilemma via Discord. How do Pratchett's comments about the limits of computer creativity compare to what's now possible with what we call AI? AI in inverted commas, i.e. chat GPT, etc. Now, I don't, I don't want to go off on a rant here. Please do. Please go off on a rant. <laughs> but uh, look, I have pretty strong feelings about this. As we record this, as you may well know, there's a massive strike going on in the US from writers and actors which is mostly about the way that the distribution model for screen media has changed from the old broadcast and cinema model to the streaming model and all of the ways in which the companies who have made that change are using it to obfuscate how much money maybe a reasonable amount to be paying the people who've created those works. You can probably tell I'm very much on the side of the striking workers here, but partly it is also about artificial intelligence. And we're not worried that things like ChatGPT will write shows instead of us and put us out of a job. Nobody's worried about that right now. I don't think in my lifetime they will get good enough to write good fiction. They're really bad at it. (laughs) Certainly can't write jokes. All they can do is rehash what's already there. But they will get good enough that they can generate a plot outline or an idea. And if you are a person who's not a creative and you think that coming up with the idea is the hard part, then what you think is an appropriate thing to do is to use an artificial intelligence to create ideas and then pay someone a shit amount of money to just polish it and make it good, Mm -hmm. as if that's the easy part. Whereas in actual fact, of course, it's the other way around. Like recognizing a good idea and executing it well and polishing it to something that's great is the work, right? The idea generation, you come up with ideas all the time. People always ask, where do your ideas come from? That's not important. Nobody cares. (laughs) Like just you have them. It's what you do with them that matters. This is something I always talk to my students about. And I mean, I think there are limits to the creativity of computers and artificial intelligence. And I also really don't like the term artificial intelligence being used to refer to things like large language models like ChatGPT, which don't have an intelligence. They don't have an understanding of what they're doing. They are using stochastic models, probability, to infer context from what you say and produce text that is probably likely to resemble what a human would say based on what humans have said before. They don't actually understand anything that you put to them. They're not really intelligent. So I think it's an interesting parallel that in this book, you know, the committee needs a human chairman or a person chairman. Doesn't I don't think it would have had to have been a human, but it, it was calibrated for humans because that's what was on the disc. But I think also the point there is not just that the humans are the creativity, but also that they are secretly the builders of the entire universe. Like I think, I think those two things are kind of inextricable at the end. And I know, Emma, you had another question where you weren't sure about the ending. I think that is what's going on there is that Kin doesn't do anything special when she interfaces with the committee except find out the truth about the builders. What she does for them is to promise that if they let her go, she will come back and help and they believe her after having watched her. So I don't think she does anything else, you know, apart from asking them to make some changes in the short term. Like she tells them there's no more demons, there's no more earthquakes. So I think there's my there's my little ChatGPT rant. Sorry, this is a big issue for me because all of the all of the things I work in are at the coalface of being affected by this right now because we've got technologies that are only like five or six years old that in the last six months, the companies that make them have suddenly just released on the public and there are people pushing for them to be adopted everywhere. But the main places that that's affecting are the arts and education, which is where I work and live. And it, so it's very, very difficult and stressful for me. And I have very strong feelings about it. So there's my little rant. Sorry, EJ, you had to sit no. here for that. No, no, that was excellent. That was very well articulated. I honestly don't know that I have anything to add, except that as you were saying that, I was sort of thinking I could see in some ways not that it's intentional, but you could definitely make an allegory out of the end of Strata for exactly this situation, which is to say that the computers 
can only do what they're told to do. Mm. You know, they can try to keep this world alive using the techniques they've already been given, but to be actually creative, to dream anything new, requires humanity or personality. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Quite That's a good word. Thank you. I like, I like that, that word. Quite a builder's soul. Yeah. You know, which you just don't have at the moment. To extend that allegory, I kind of feel like the committee in the disk control room are a bit like a stochastic model. Like they're a bit like a large language model in that they can do a lot with what they know, but they actually don't have any understanding of the outside universe. They know it exists, which is more than, you know, ChatGPT does, for example, <laughs> um, but they can't access it. They can't do anything with it when a human asks them. Um, but they also do have creativity because they can say, look, we reacted to someone coming from outside and our reaction was that guy's a jerk. So we don't trust <laughs> people from outside anymore. And when you turn up, we're just going to watch you and see if you're trustworthy. No, you broke my allegory. But no, you're quite right. No, I thought I thought I was because just extending it. I'm being creative. My, my well, point was basically that ChatGPT cannot. Well, okay. I suppose ChatGPT can create based on what already exists. Exactly. Like, that's my big takeaway with, with AI is like, by definition, a large language model can only iterate on what already exists. And yeah. one of the things humans can do that it can't is come up with something genuinely new based on existing things. And do it with intention. I mean, this is the other thing is that because some people would argue that, well, that's all humans do. Like no human comes up with a completely 100% original story. It's all remixes of their own life experience and the culture that they live in. And you're like, to a certain extent, sure, but they don't do that consciously. They start with an intention of a story they want to tell or a feeling they want to evoke or a, you know, a situation they want to convey or an idea. And then they tell a story and it's shaped by that culture, but they don't go and watch six movies and go and I'll have that bit of that movie and this bit of that movie and this bit of that. They don't do that consciously. They don't go, well, if I start with this scene in a probability sense, what we're used to is the most likely thing to happen after that is this. And that's why these machines are particularly bad at fiction because mm. everything they write is so cliched and so tropey. Like there's no surprise in it whatsoever. Yep. It's very difficult to enjoy fiction written by <laughs> large language <laughs> models. I'm sorry. I feel like this is the start of an entire university course that could easily be run on like oh, God. AI versus yes. human creativity, and it would be amazing. I'm extremely personally conflicted about AI because I agree with all of the philosophical points, and I've also just personally found it actually really useful at work. Oh, look, don't get me wrong. I think it's got some really great applications. Mm. There's so many things that it can do that are useful, but we have to be very careful because it doesn't understand what it's doing. And so yeah. it makes a lot of mistakes, but it never sounds like it's made a mistake. <laughs> but I absolutely think that the technology itself does have some great real world applications. So I'm not anti large language models <laughs> in general. I'm very anti how they're being marketed and how we're being told to use them and the way they're being portrayed because they are not intelligences and we are not around the corner from an artificial general intelligence. Like that God, is, Elon that is not going to happen in our lifetimes, are. if ever. Oh. Yeah. We are not going to have data from Star Trek or um, <laughs> what's his name from Asimov. It's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not. Or if it is, it's going to happen from a completely different place. It's not going to be mm, chat GPT. It's not where it's going to start. Anyway. All right. This one comes from Adam by email. What do you think about the idea that Strata is to Discworld what the fake fossils in Strata are to its characters, worldview, and philosophy? That's a really interesting one. I think that's very clever. I like that. I think you're right. I think it is. Well, in a way, like I think it's more, uh, it's not quite the same, is it? Because it's sort of like a version 0.1, isn't it? Mm. But it's its own thing too. I mean, yeah. It depends how literal you want to get, I think. Like it's not literal. I don't think literally if the people of the Discworld, you know, dug deep enough, they would find out that actually the entire thing is mechanical and was created by the, yeah. by you know the builders but also i can definitely see it as terry pratchett's version of the like if you're used to reading yes. discworld books and then you come along and read strata that's absolutely the plesiosaur carrying the nuclear testing sign yeah if you dug down into terry pratchett's brain <laughs> you would yes. find underneath the discworld you go what's all this stuff about a spaceship and a computer controlling the disc that's weird um, exactly. you're like it's not real it's just fake but it's there yeah yeah I, it's just such an interesting alternate idea of what this world could have been. But I also think, yeah, absolutely, you, you could have written a whole series of books about this universe, but I don't think any of the other ones would have been about the flat disc. Mm. 
because by definition, its story is told yeah. in Strata. You know, it ends with the end of the disc world, essentially. Like, we're going to evacuate everyone off it. And mm. I feel like even a book about that evacuation process or about the people getting used to their new spherical home would be such a completely different thing that it's not something Terry Pratchett yeah. would write. What do you think the sequel would be? Because I've just thought about that and I've got an idea now, but I'm interested to know, do you have an idea about what a good sequel would be? I would be fascinated by a sequel that starts pretty soon after the end of this book, Mm. where we do get to see the collapse of the company. We get to see what that does to the society that Kin comes from, which we, you know, we get a lot of hints of, but we don't see that much of. And Mm. I would, it would be interesting to see that from the point of view of a completely different set of protagonists or to see it in parallel to Kin trying to get everything sorted out to be able to go and make this world for herself. Mm. But it would be a very different book. And again, I mean, this might just be my shortcoming, but I struggle to picture how you'd make it a comedy in the way yeah, that that's fair. Terry Pratchett's books are, a comedy and an exploration of people rather than exploration of social structures. Yeah. I mean, we didn't say this very much explicitly, although we mentioned a few jokes, but this book is pretty funny. <laughs> There's some oh, yeah. great jokes in Absolutely. It. I definitely, again, this is one of those things that I like about the later Pratchett books and I struggle with in the earlier ones. It does feel sometimes like they're a little bit shoehorned in. Mm. Like, I'm just going to drop mm. this dad joke here because because I got her. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it is very funny. Well, the thing I thought, and I think this is more likely what kind of sequel you would write, is you'd set it hundreds of years later, if not a thousand years later, when the disc people on their new planet have evolved their civilization to the point where they're going to join the galactic civilization. Hmm. And then you see how their society has evolved, like what the, and you'd like, if you're writing it now, you'd set it in their equivalent of 2023 and you'd explore what's their world like, what's their, how's it evolved differently. You'd have to write it very sensitively for the reasons we touched on earlier, but I think mm-hmm. that could be really interesting. But I'm torn because I also want more of Kin and Marco and Silver because I love them so much. <laughs> well, I mean, we've established Kin is 200 years old. There's no reason she couldn't keep going. That's true. And particularly now that they kind of know that they're the awakened gods within, you know, like they, yeah. could have, they could find more builder tech. We've also established, like, canonically that when they make a new world, they put someone to sleep in orbit around it waiting for them to. That's true. Reach. Maybe Kin gets attached enough to these people and this place that she decides to be that person. She becomes their watcher. Oh, yeah. No, I can dig that. a really cool story. Yeah. And then I imagine that maybe Silver would maybe, I mean, we don't know how long Shans live. I don't think it's mentioned. Mm. So maybe Shans is just really long lived. I would love that. Yeah. And Silver's still there. But then it's like one of Marco's descendants. There you go. Yeah. I would read that yeah. book. That would be Marco great. Marco is remembered <laughs> gloriously. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh. We never even did get to the talking about Kong Anatomy or any of that stuff. There was no, too much else didn't. to talk about. I know. Well, we, no, well, maybe we'll have to do we'll have to do like a bonus thing <laughs> at some point we, if, yeah. you, if you're up for it. We could do that. But for now, we should finish up because we've all got lives. We could talk about this <laughs> book forever. We talk about any book forever. That's the beauty of books. They Pretty fire much. up your imagination. But thank you, EJ, so much for being a guest and talking about this book. And particularly for making the effort to read it in print. I'm so sorry that the um, the audio book is not generally available. I do. I swear one has been made, uh, but a lot of the because they were made in the era of like cassettes and CDs. A lot of the earlier ones, particularly, are no longer in print, which is why the new Penguin Discworld ones exist. Um, Look, I'm very grateful to you for revealing to me the existence of the terrible abridged versions <laughs> for what they are. They're not terrible. Off cause I'm not, no, 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 the fact that they're abridged is terrible. So okay, now I'm yes. going to have to, you know. Well, famously, to- Terry Pratchett hated it. And, in fact, Tony Robinson thought Terry Pratchett hated him for a long time when actually he Aww. was just really grumpy about the fact that they abridged his books for the audiobooks. But they did it because mm-hmm. back in those days they abridged most audiobooks because they wanted them to be short enough to be sold as books on tape. I mean, there was a market for unabridged books on tape, but then you'd have to buy like a special – thing with like eight cassettes in it or whatever and it, it was a whole other thing so yeah he didn't like that either so in the future <laughs> yeah now we don't have to deal with them at all ej if people want to find out more about you or read some of your fiction that you have mm-hmm. put out into the public sphere where's the best place for them to do that yeah so you did mention that i'm an occasional spec fic writer i haven't actually been for for the last few years but i I go through patches and my website does still exist. I checked this morning very carefully. Uh, so <laughs> if people you. want to find out more about my 
writing or read any of it, you can find me at ehmanwrites, which is E-H-M-A-N-N, writes.com. And if you want to check out Bush Heritage, Google Bush Heritage. They're also I will put a link to both of those things in our episode notes Amazing. so people can find them very easily. And listen, thank you, listener, for coming with us on this journey to Strata. It's been a tricky one to fit it all into one episode. We might do for our subscribers some bonus content some little extra questions we didn't get time to ask because we got a surprisingly huge amount of questions. We don't usually get that many for a non-disc world book. So thank you, everyone who sent in a question, even if we didn't quite get to yours. There are a few we didn't answer because we kind of covered it, I think, in the discussion. But yes, if you're a subscriber, watch out. We might try and put some bonus Strata content your way in the near future. Uh, But next time, we are heading back to the disc, the real disc this time, for the short story Theatre of Cruelty, which features the Ankh-Morpork City Watch. That's going to be our September episode, Pratchat 70, and we're hoping to be joined by Irish author Cueve McDonnell, who's written, among other things, the Stranger Times series of comedic supernatural novels. As usual, get your questions in as soon as you can, preferably by the last week of August. The hashtag to use if you're going to do that via social media is Pratchat70. And while we're on the subject of social media, we are now on Blue Sky. You'll find us there at pratchatpodcast.com, just the same as our actual website. But uh, don't use the hashtags there because as it turns out, hashtags aren't a thing on Blue Sky. Who knew? Uh, Look, we're not sure if we're going to be there long term, but we are there at the moment. So if you want to use it, use it. We'll be keeping an eye out for you. Uh, but you'll need to reply to us directly. You can still send in questions via all the usual ways. We're on Twitter, Mastodon, Facebook, and Instagram as well. And we'll continue to call it Twitter, no matter what anybody says, uh, and <laughs> for as long as it exists. And, of course, you can email us at chat at pratchatpodcast.com if you want to send your questions in that way. I'd also just like to thank our subscribers for making the show possible. We really couldn't do it without you. You're the reason we don't have to put ads in the show and also why we don't have to sell our souls to any super intelligent computers that would otherwise take our jobs. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, if you'd like to be a subscriber, you can find out more about that at pratchatpodcast.com. And if you want to support the show without paying us any money, which is totally fine. We love it when people do that. All you need to do is tell people about the show. Uh, let them know in person, put it in your social media. Anything you can do to spread the word is always very welcome. And I'd just like to stick in an extra little thank you uh, at the end here to both EJ and to Liz. We had some troubles making this month's episode. As you might know, if you're a regular listener, it's been rescheduled a couple of times. uh, And I was so pleased that both of them were able to take advantage of a last minute opportunity we had to record this episode. So thank you both very much for making that happen. But that's enough from me. So until next time, remember the super intelligent builder of the entire universe was inside you all along. You've been listening to Pratchat, the monthly Terry Pratchett book club podcast with Pratchatters Elizabeth Flux, Ben McKenzie, that's me, and guest EJ Mann. Pratchat is produced and edited by me with music by David Ashton. We're on Twitter, Mastodon, Instagram, and Facebook, and you can listen to past episodes and support the production of new ones via pratchatpodcast.com. Join the conversation for this episode using the hashtag Pratchat68. Pratchat is brought to you by Splendid Chaps Productions. We make entertainment for your ears, like the Doctor Who podcast Splendid Chaps and time travel comedy series Night Terrace. To find out more, visit SplendidChaps.com.